Tere, hello, good afternoon, hyvää iltapäivää, privet, siem. Hello, 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 please come in. Keynote presenter came, that's a release. Hello, I am Andres Jezer and I am really happy to be a moderator for today in this physical world and also in the digital. Welcome to everybody who is watching us and listening and participating here in Erinevate Arvamuste Tuba, this room of different opinions, if I may translate it in any way, or who is present in a YouTube just right now or if you are watching it some days later. Now we are opening a digital forum, digital cultural forum, and I would like to invite here Eva Lemet uh, from Law Based, Creative Estonia for the opening words. Please. Thank you, Andres. Tere kõigile. Welcome to everyone. Creative Estonia is Creative Industries Development Center, and uh, we take care of creative and cultural industries development so that digitalization is one of the very important topics now it came to our lives to stay so we can't avoid it and uh, it's better to be prepared how to use this digitalization in our everyday life that it will be useful for us to our businesses to our life and makes it better. I'm very proud that today's conference is taking place with the support of uh, our partners from Nordic Ministries Council in Estonia Northern. Also our uh, Erasmus Plus supported project Creative Digital Transformation is finalizing our activities these days here in Tallinn and welcome our partners from Germany, Spain, Romania, Italy, so that um, uh, we are only strong together. Collaboration is the key word also in digitalization activities and digital world. So I wish you fruitful conference, all of you who came here to room of club of different rooms and welcome these who are watching us in YouTube. And uh, please enjoy the speakers as Estonians always does. We are very much like to learn from Nordic countries. We have excellent cases and speakers from Nordic part. Now I give floor to our main partner on this conference organization. Um, and maybe Andres, you will introduce. Thank you. Thank you, Eva, and thank you. And now I would like to invite uh, here to give uh, opening words to Christer Haglund from the Ministry of, uh, Nordic Minister of Culture and, and thank you for supporting our events uh, during many, many years. Thank you and uh, warmly welcome also on behalf of the Nordic uh, Council of Ministers Office uh, in Estonia. Uh, digital uh, cooperation is a priority for all the Nordic and uh, Baltic uh, countries with the aim for all of us to become the most integrated, sustainable and competitive region by 2030. And uh, Nordic and Estonian cooperation, as we know, is based on the history, culture and uh, a similar values and uh, we at the Nordic Council of Ministers office here in Estonia has uh, supported already for many many years uh, the development of creative industries uh, because we think that uh, it is very important it is uh, and it also have uh, 
have a, a, a growing uh, economical value. Last year, uh, we decided to uh, arrange a discussion at the Opinion Festival, Arvamos Festival here in, in, in Estonia, Paide, uh, uh, a discussion on the digitalization of culture. And the turnout was an instant success, success and uh, well over 3,000 persons uh, watched, for example, uh, the stream. So it was only natural for us uh, to explore it uh, further together with our partners, uh, and that is actually why we are here today, to discuss whether digital technologies can connect art and culture more uh, closely, or if it is more of a passing trend, and what the pros and cons are. Since uh, this is a relatively new phenomenon, we know for sure that there are at least uh, some challenges, and, but probably also a lot of opportunities ahead of us. Fashion, music, films are, as we know, shared rapidly all over the world, and we can get more understanding of uh, new culture new cultures uh, uh, we never actually uh, physically even uh, visited. At the same time, we also need to be aware of the fact that uh, there is a digital divide, those who are in and those who are not. So what are the next uh, generation technologies in culture? culture? This is something uh, we will discuss about uh, and it's important to look uh, for the opportunities for creative industries and, and uh, cultural organization. And together with our esteemed Estonian partners, excellent speakers, speakers, and you, our wonderful audience here live today or following us uh, on YouTube, we are trying to share uh, some food for thoughts on this uh, delicate matter. So big thanks uh, to all the cooperation partners and to all of you for participating today. Let's make uh, today's event a very useful one for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. So, let's start with a very academic approach. I have the honor to invite here Professor of Media Innovation from Tallinn University, Indrek Kibrus, and if we, I talk by behalf of myself, I am a practitioner learning from my grandchild how to use the internet and how to be digital, so Indrek knows what will be in the future in an academic sense. Spatial internet is a word I learned from looking into Indrek's presentation. Hopefully, hopefully this is something which will be interesting for you too. Let's see what the future will be. Please. Yeah, hello. What is it? Good, good. Is it good afternoon uh, already? Perhaps it is. So welcome. Um, uh, I, I listed that the authors of these um, presentations are me and GPT-4. I've had the chance to play with GPT-4 the last couple of days. And literally, I had a bunch of notes and I, did, I had rather little time yesterday. So I fed the notes to the engine and asked to produce the bullet points and I used those bullet points mostly, although I, I, although I rephrased some things, I reorganized them a little, but uh, literally this is one of the great tools I could, uh, that are, uh, the kind of tools that are increasingly around and uh, highly useful. Uh, yeah, but I will be discussing a little bit the AI and machine learning in the context of the specialization of the internet also in the next 20 minutes. Um, so, uh, before I start telling you or discussing the, the nature of the spatial internet, I'm going to tell you what is my grounding, what, is my, how, what constitutes my right to even talk about these things. Uh, we uh, run several research projects within Tallinn University's BFM, the Baltic Film Media and Art School. And related to this talk today, uh, two of them are more relevant than others. Firstly, I'm the uh, principal investigator of something called uh, our research project called Public Value of Open Cultural Data Systems, uh, where we uh, do uh, different things. Firstly, we, 
we try to experiment with network analysis or data, data analytics methods to understand how value, especially public value, what is valuable for most people in a society, is actually generated in culture and creative, and creative industries, cultural industries, and so on. Because culture tends to be this kind of right, hidden or um, black box in a way. We don't really understand how valuable, what is actually considered valuable, often is produced by many, many people. Many people contribute. We build on what others have been doing. So we don't really understand where did this valuable stuff actually come from. So we try to understand this kind of networked relationships. We tend to have increasingly data about this. Study the networks, who worked with whom, how did they arrive at this good stuff, and why is it good? Why is it, uh, by whom is it valued, to whom it makes sense. So we do that. Secondly, we, we build those kinds of linked data systems increasingly uh, for, um, for media institutions, especially in Estonian case, ERR, our public service broadcaster, ourselves. We, do, we use AI, machine learning, to, to, to produce new kinds of metadata, linked data systems that are all about, to, in a way, would be better revealing how value is being created, linking meaningful units so that we understand how stuff is being related to each other, so that we are, if we want to find something in the enormous culture databases, we don't only find them, but we really find those meaningful relationships that we are interested in and perhaps want to further study. Uh, what we also do is we study carefully blockchain-based audiovisual increasingly that the stuff that is the platforms and let's say protocols that have been emerging, how they are different when it comes to producing value and for whom when it comes to audiovisual industries. We, we have been studying specifically these kind of um, YouTube-like services that are increasingly out there and that re 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 remunerate uh, creators in using entirely different kinds of logics than YouTube, for instance. Uh, then we have been actually building these systems up ourselves, the blockchain-based data systems. For We work with an international startup called White Rabbit that is developing entirely new, basically, value, value creation, value uh, control, value management uh, data system for the film industry. Uh, I won't have time to to discuss this uh, right now, but perhaps at some point in the future. And also, we in Tallinn University, we are having something called the Mint Cluster, Mint, Mincing, ta-da, um, where we are looking into exactly the, the, the Web3 or the um, emergence of the spatial internet, because at BFM, we are obviously also concerned that the, the affordances of the, of the new internet uh, all the film production methods even are increasingly spatial and we need to be, get really good at how to tell stories in this, using these new spatial media, uh, uh, both in, as a kind of production measure as well as a literally a storytelling platform. So we have, we have kind of created this kind of university-wide um, initiative that we call Metaverse Cluster, uh, Mind the Metaverse Cluster, uh, shortened for some reason as Mint Cluster. So uh, this is our research and development focus within the university in the broader, broader sense, but also BFM in a narrow sense, is, is very much on these topics that I'm gonna discuss uh, uh, with you today. So, uh, so what is the spatial, uh, spatial web? So you have heard about virtual reality, you may have heard about augmented reality, uh, you may have heard about the 5G, you may have heard about the Internet of Things. Spatial web is all this stuff together. So, and many people call it web 3.0. Why 3.0? Because the web 1.0 was to, so to speak, everybody can read and write, publish, more or less, freely. Yeah, everybody gets a voice using this global standard uh, we know as the internet, or its communication standard. Web 2.0 was for a while celebrated as, you know, the where the web interfaces became uh, participatory or interactive in the sense that we could all do something there. We could contribute. We could publish our, uh, our, our videos on, on big platforms, uh, communicate there, communicate with each other, etc., etc. It was celebrated for a while as a as, as great achievement, yeah, participation. Uh, when, after YouTube became a bigger thing, 
uh, I think it was the Time magazine, or was it Newsweek, that had you as a person uh, of the year on their, on their cover arguing that now everybody is empowered by the internet. What we learned later is that via this participation, what also came around was the data collection about everybody. Uh, the, the, the basic business model of the Web 2.0 was then advertising based on that collected data. Um, and the big platforms could grow ever bigger and bigger platform, ever bigger and more powerful because they were relying on something called the network effects, meaning that where everybody is also more people want to join in so they get ever more of that data. They will be ever central also when it comes to, let's say, global value flows of, of resources, money, talents, etc. So there, there was clear this concentration of creation and also, let's be, let's be honest, relatively unfair remuneration practices of, of the actual creators. Everybody's dependent on those platforms. Um, and now the, sort of the promise with the, in the context of Web 3.0, especially if you use that term Web 3, is that the hope that we can decentralize um, connectedness. So we can all connect to each other and share resources and transfer value to each other using these infrastructures and we can cut out these centralized big intermediaries and this way uh, turn the whole global um, internet value system more, uh, more fair, more decentralized. But when I'm talking about 3.0, then it's not only about uh, Web3, the blockchain-based internet uh, or the digital distributed ledgers-based internet, but it's also about Spatial internet uh, and spatialization, of course, comes from the new standards of the 5G mobile connectivity, uh, meaning that uh, that is unavoidably much more spatially aware. Um, uh, that, so that the, the kind of the web 2.5 was, you know, mobile internet that where internet became spatially aware in terms of two-dimensionality, you know, volt and volt, etc. They know where we are. They can come to us and provide their services, right? So this is two-dimensional space awareness, space, space basedness of the internet services. But now, um, what will um, expectedly come with the three, Web 3.0 is not only two dimensions and three, but three dimensions. We know every, what, where every little material object or uh, organic live object is in the space. Uh, so obviously it will kind of call for a new innovation, uh, innovation wave when it comes to these three dimensions of space, uh, internet awareness of all the dimensions, so to speak. Um, but um, when I first introduced you that we are also doing linked data, so the semantic web standards, and some of you here might know that Web 3.0 was first understood uh, as the internet that is based on the semantic web standards. So everything is, internet consists of links or between items and we all, and the metadata is such that we know, we understand what everything is, a photo, a table, etc., and the links between them. So I don't know who owns this table, Erina the Duba the Klubi, we, Erina the Duba the Klubi and this table are linked. We know Erina the Duba Klubi owns that table. We know what everybody, Erina what the Duba the Klubi is. So this Erina the Duba the Klubi, know, the internet knows this. What this is, establishes the context for that table and increasingly the semantic web kind of this interlinkedness and this, that is everything is semantic. We understand the relationships, it creates the situation where context of everything, the meaning of everything is better graspable by the machines uh, and you know much of the much of the AI uh, explosion that we are uh, experiencing now, the GPT-4, etc., is built on the fact that we understand the relationships between all entities. Yeah. Um, so and of course this will be transferred over to the Web 3.0 as well. That is spatial, that is interlinked, uh, and is decentralized in terms of governance mechanisms. Um, now. Um, when I have written the meaningfully linked virtual and physical realities, the big debate has for a long been that, hey, there is virtual reality and there is augmented reality, and they are rather different when it comes to their affordances. 
um, the, the argument goes with Web 3.0 is that it is kind of, it probably ends up as a continuum. Because probably uh, there is a concept called digital twin that also Estonia is pretty good at. Um, they, under the Minister of Economic Affairs, what has been built up. Is this how much time I have left? <laughs> okay, so I have very little time left. Uh, left. So anyhow, um, uh, we are building up here in Estonia something called um, something called um, um, uh, digital twin that is making that is public infrastructure that describes basically for the machine what happens in the public space or uh, in all space in Estonia. So kind of um, computerized description of the physical space. Um, and much of the services kind of build up these digital twins because they need to, to provide, to, to innovate in this spatialized web. We need to uh, understand this. And, and of many of the virtual reality worlds will somehow probably need to interact with that real reality, so to speak. Uh, hence, there's going to be many multiple versions of it. Um, and uh, and uh, there's going to be versions of it. We, 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 can, we can enjoy some, some modalities, some versions of it that, is, that are more real, that is more relevant to our everyday lives. And there's going to be versions that are completely fantasy, but maybe still in some various forms, because the semantic web will be behind it, still related to uh, that real, real reality. So we can always choose what kind of how much of playfulness, how much of artificiality, etc., we want at any point. Either we want to be informed about the real facts or we want to be entertained in some, uh, to escape some uh, fairy tale worlds. Um, now, um, because I have so much little time left, uh, I'm going to cover some of the um, aspects here so, um, that are perhaps more important. Um, and of course, what really matters in this, in this environment is, is this decentralization enabled by the blockchain uh, technologies that we, it is imperative that, let's just say we will, the, we, the, the machines, the internet will, be, will become aware of the public spaces here in the Delis Kiwi Center, right? We, went, we have, up until this point, we, have, we tended to think about these as public spaces to be shared by everybody. But then some big platform will come here, will build up their own services in this semi-virtual place on top of it, and then all of a sudden it's not really public anymore because it's actually that the virtual versions of it are controlled by some of the seminar platforms that will, will run again their data collection, uh, rent-seeking kind of uh, uh, models. And can we say that they are public anymore? We will be again in a public space be completely reliant on the business decisions uh, and advertised deliverance of these platforms. So we probably don't want that anymore. So we probably need to move towards these blockchain-based versions where everybody cons controls their own data. And also what is extremely important, as I said, that there's going to be continuum between artificial versions of things and more factual things. Blockchains will, re will record what is what credibly. We, it's always established the source of something, what is the purpose of something, so that we are not getting lost as much, perhaps, as we are up until this point and where the problems are, uh, fake news and misinformation and all that, because we don't understand where is, where is something coming from, any piece of content, any piece of information. Okay, so I need to um, sum it up. Um, of course, um, uh, the whole this spatial internet doesn't happen just on its own. We need standards. We need to agree how this whole thing technologically as well as other standards, meaning ethical conduct and such, needs to work. So there's a lot of work happening around it right now in WBC, which is the main internet standardization body. But of course, what, has, what have emerged is, are all kinds of um, um, more autonomous, more independent standardization bodies exactly for the metaverse or spatial web. You see those some of the names on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the screen there. Uh, Onto chain is something that is, uh, um, I, I, I tended to claim some five years ago that what will, will eventually happen is, is semantic web and blockchain based uh, systems emerging and Onto chain is one of those uh, merging, converging. And then so the Onto chain is one of these initiatives that actually works towards that and 
our research group is also contributing uh, to, towards that um, initiative. Uh, and here, there are some of the central principles that all these standardizers are looking at, that what this new version of the internet will be, that's going to be spatial. Ownership is something that is distributed. We need to be able to control our own data. Um, also, um, that everything is recorded there uh, in the, on the blockchain safely. We understand the sources of things. Security, of course, when we have such complex systems, the, the cryptogra cryptography and um, and, and, and the, the communications are secure and pr uh, privacy is also secured, is, is of utmost importance. Um, and of course, the whole discussion, I don't know how much you've been following these debates about, let's say, should we, should we, should we be able to, let's say, transfer one asset from one world to another? Let's say you have one sword in one game and will you be able or have the right to use that same asset in a different game? These are interesting questions. People are debating, but this kind of asset transfer from between these worlds is something that is actually uh, an interesting, interesting discussion point and uh, something people are working on. So in Estonia, what is the, why are we even talking about this? What's, of course, it's nice to know what they do out there in the big world, and things will take time. These, these, these things won't happen overnight. Uh, in special web we won't be ready in tomorrow, also in one year, or even in two years. But at some point, there will be developments towards that. And so what, what should we think about? How should we think about this in Estonian context? Uh, firstly, realization simply that it's, it, it is coming. You know, you, you may be ironic about the metaverse, I am too, um, but, um, by, but as a matter of fact, standardizers are working towards this. Um, tele tele telecommunications companies are, are working towards enabling this, so in one way or another, it will happen. Second point, this will bring along enormous innovation wave. And I would argue, of course, it will, it will be important for self-driving cars or storage. You have big storage spaces outside of uh, the town and uh, you, you, it's important you know where every little item in these storage houses is. This is what people tend to be in, discussed in Thailand Technical University and so on. But I would argue that actually the main driving aspect of the, of the spatial internet are the creative industries because it's all about Experience something as a space really means experiencing. The focus is on the world of experience. Yeah, you, you have a chance to experience spaces differently. Um, and, and this means really understanding the human psychology and providing them interesting experiences mean meaningful stuff. And this is the domain of, of creative and cultural industries. Um, so, and of course, Actually, even in, in terms of general economic theory, we are arriving at the, at, the, at the point in time where people are starting to realize these old Marxist ideas that the economy comes first and the, and the culture comes as a kind of superstructure on top of it are really outdated because what anthropologists have been really discovering in the last few years how in the, in the course of human history really always the cultural experience drive has come first before, before any major uh, economic uh, organization innovation. So, um, so my big claim, uh, which is convenient to make here for this audience, is that this will be driven by, uh, by culture and creative industries. And, and secondly, uh, well, or thirdly, um, uh, we in Estonian context, when we become aware of this, then we need to take, start to take very seriously all the efforts towards enabling these um, uh, decentralized governance mechanisms. So financial inspection uh, authority in Estonia was a couple of years really kind of threatening everybody experimenting with these, uh, with these systems. I think we need to really look at the innovation side of things and not, 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 to, not to undermine uh, this, this, this sphere of activity, especially because this undermining has already happened. Estonia has been extremely slow when building up their 5G networks, uh, and this probably has undermined our ant 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 uh, the ability of our entrepreneurs to innovate in this sphere. And of course, when it comes to sort of public-private partnership, then public sector needs to continue also the work on the 
digital twin because Estonia's digital twin right now is being built up only for the purpose of that we become aware of the construction problem. So where to build houses and where are the spaces and how to control the uh, space in this sense. But we need to understand that this is really the infrastructure for all other kinds of services relating to space. Uh, what the great human country industries can provide. So, um, and hence open sharing of as much of spatial uh, public uh, open data that we can, uh, that we can. All right, and I'm very sorry, I was much, so much more uh, late than I planned. <laughs> uh, we have a microphone there. If, if in audience uh, there are questions uh, to Professor Ibrus, and this is a last chance to see, as it was a film, book, and a well, TV series actually about disappearing species. But Indrik is not disappearing. <laughs> Definitely, he is looking into, you know, into the future. I cannot, ah, I see, yes, please. Hello, you said uh, that uh, we are already creating these digital twins in Estonia. Where exactly? I don't know. Estonia Minister of Economic Affairs is responsible for that. It's actually, in, there's a version already existing, but it's very basic. I know the digital twin of Helsinki exists, but... Uh, Estonia as well. So we have, uh, this goes like a soap opera from Latin America, that we have twins we are not aware. Uh, but uh, in a digital world, everything can, uh, can happen. Uh, if there are no more questions, then thank you. Thank you, Indrik, and uh, yes, once more. Give <laughs> Oh, it's not the digital. I thought that these souvenirs will be the NFTs. No, it's uh, physical ones, still more reliable. Now, uh, welcome uh, on the stage, please. Uh, advise, digital advisor of Minister of Edu uh, Culture, Carlo Fu, physically here, talking about digital culture, Estonian state strategy, if not mistaken. Yeah, that's uh, correct. Uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, Carlo and uh, advisor also on audiovisual uh, and uh, culture, which means I have a kind of uh, double role. So um, the strategy of digital culture was um, you know, created during the um, past year and a half, probably. Uh, and uh, the idea is to, was to describe um, or to make clear what should we actually do in the coming years uh, within the framework of um, a wider Culture 2030 strategy, uh, how we can uh, apply to this uh, and adapt to this new world, uh, which uh, Indirect uh, just uh, talked about, uh, where um, basically everywhere, everything everywhere all at once, uh, that is going to happen soon. and. Um, but the main aim was to uh, create a cultural strategy. So that means um, uh, the strategy for Minister of Culture, which explains how arts, uh, theater, music uh, can uh, adapt to it and bring in also some new themes, uh, some new topics, some things that are going to happen soon. So this is basically the um, mm, uh, wider framework of uh, Culture 2030, which says that the Estonian culture is uh, living, developing, open to the world, and uh, people uh, are um, uh, participating in Estonian culture. It's a natural part of life. Uh, the uh, cultural life is strong and uh, functioning. Um, culture, role of culture and uh, creativity are um, appreciated in the development of society, and uh, the uh, cultural memory is uh, kind of uh, well preserved and uh, appreciated, evalu evaluated. And also that uh, blue uh, text there is a, um, basically saying the same, that um, uh, participating in cultural life is the most uh, important uh, topic. Um, I just um, found one quote from the digital strategy which explains uh, what we are aiming at. Just a quick uh, note. And um, it's also um, emphasizing uh, kind of the 
role of national culture within the global uh, digital culture. So uh, why was it actually uh, needed apart from uh, uh, adapting? What were the um, more um, clear or concrete uh, um, uh, goals? It was uh, quickly noted that basically all the uh, different uh, art uh, branches are uh, have different kind of problems. It's much um, it's easy to see how uh, modern uh, contemporary music industry or audiovisual industry are uh, very well digitized already. Or we can say actually that literature by now is uh, fully digitized, and that was basically one of the first uh, fields. And now probably the even the writer kind of theoretically, becomes uh, unnecessary in literature at some point, uh, although it wouldn't happen. But uh, yes, the first uh, need was to describe the uh, digital dimension in, in all the existing uh, art fields. Um, second um, kind of reason was that uh, the uh, state had been active in um, culture for already quite a while and uh, the whole digitization process started with um, heritage. So uh, the uh, artifacts in museums were digitized, described. There is a huge database of uh, photos, all kinds of um, museums. All the museums have their own um, databases and um, uh, I think it was perhaps more than 30% that was digitized by this first wave. But um, this didn't bring uh, us close uh, to the really to the use of this uh, digitized uh, heritage, and uh, this is one of the topics that needs to be addressed in the future. And also, it's a priority of European Commission. Um, we already talked about here about um, digital gap or digital dividing uh, skills. Uh, new technologies cha changing the businesses and the whole uh, uh, value chain. Um, and um, obviously, small country uh, needs to adapt to that. Um, when basically the digital strategy is saying uh, what we would need to do to uh, adapt to the current situation and how can we uh, help the arts uh, moving uh, further and uh, how can we uh, make uh, culture and arts uh, part of the uh, uh, inclusive uh, society. So some of the things are pretty kind of obvious. Um, we need to um, uh, integrate cultural uh, policy more into other policies of the state. And um, um, although it sounds a little bit sloganish, I would say uh, this is um, the, the overall um, integrated picture helps definitely more to argue for, for culture within all the changes in uh, society. Um, the centrally coordinated policy of digital culture means that uh, so far all the initiatives have been uh, rather separated. It's um, project-based development of different branches of, uh, let's say, digitization of museums or there are digital art projects that are supported, but it, didn't, uh, uh, it doesn't form any kind of um, uh, meaningful uh, idea of the ecosystem where it actually works. Um, the digital uh, needs of uh, the competencies of Estonian um, uh, creati creators and um, users of uh, cultural content need to be developed. Um, and um, the digital arts, um, are um, seen as um, something a new emerging art form which also needs specific um, uh, technological means and skills to uh, move uh, further. And uh, also the, uh, those skills and uh, this knowledge will help the um, creators to adapt more clearly uh, to the um, uh, those new uh, new needs uh, new, uh, to create new business strategies and um, uh, to, al to develop services and companies uh, that are not, not there yet. 
the next block, which is kind of um, um, final, it's the second part of this uh, strategy. Uh, it's focusing on um, uh, the need of, uh, to develop those uh, services which are uh, not there yet, which would uh, help us uh, to uh, actually access new words and uh, new um, heritage using uh, platforms or uh, whatever uh, is, will be created. For example, um, the Flemish government has developed a digital um, e-pass, which um, means that uh, the um, information from all the digital platforms where you as a citizen uh, ha have been visiting, they, uh, the digital um, uh, systems uh, record your preferences, create your uh, profile, and uh, you are able to use uh, the different uh, IT systems which are culture related so that your uh, profile is brought into it and you, are, you will get receive suggestions to um, uh, see um, the content which uh, is um, arranged according to your profile. So this is, would be one of the examples how to um, develop public services that are not uh, that are new and uh, innovative. The digital preservation has been an important part already, uh, but it needs uh, further developing. Uh, it uh, needs to, uh, the, the um, archiving environment and um, players need to agree on how to uh, guarantee a long time uh, preserving, uh, not just uh, one of digitization. Uh, and uh, uh, this needs a uh, proper uh, strategy which will be created during the uh, next few years as well. And I think one of the key topics uh, for us, for a small country, is also um, that the um, culture of a small country um, should be available in uh, global um, uh, platforms. When you go to, uh, let's say, services like uh, uh, was, was it Play Watch? Watch Play, uh, where you can uh, find any uh, find out where any title uh, of, let's say, film is playing in the um, uh, streaming services. Uh, you notice that uh, there are actually very few Estonian films, or even fewer of them are active on, on those uh, platforms. Where the case with the music might be better, and the uh, global access to uh, already digitized content uh, that we do have is uh, rather rather limited, and uh, we need to find a solution here as well. And uh, finally, the promise, which uh, also Indrek mentioned, is that uh, the uh, data we have should be available as a public uh, data, and uh, this is uh, kind of problematic because when taking a closer look um, at uh, what we actually do have, uh, it's um, uh, rather separated. Uh, this information cannot be linked easily with, uh, to each other, and uh, this is the one of the fields where we have to um, uh, arrange, uh, the, uh, uh, organize the um, uh, policies uh, first uh, to get really interconnected and uh, easily available data on basic uh, cultural things. Um, the wider idea of the um, digital strategy is to ensure that um, um, culture is also part of um, uh, innovation, that um, we are not, the minister is not kind of uh, leading from the process from um, up because it's not possible in digital environment has to uh, be done in uh, cooperation with the uh, private sector, with uh, other public organizations, with uh, private, private companies, and um, we are uh, aiming to be uh, a partner in this process and um, not uh, the, simply the regulating body as someone might see the government usually. And also, 
the um, other strategies uh, are uh, interrelated to our goals and um, this is what we try to achieve with other um, uh, public uh, organizations and uh, ministries as well. Um, what has been happening so far is um, the um, digitization programs have uh, focused on the heritage. Uh, like I said, uh, there are um, huge uh, databases on, let's say, sports, on uh, uh, creative unions uh, that are used as um, kind of supporting services to help um, creators or to uh, provide some social um, services but uh, not so much on the creating uh, new forms of, um, uh, of art or uh, new forms of culture. Uh, there are a number of um, streaming uh, services uh, available, which is also kind of obvious. Uh, the um, public broadcaster is the, one of the biggest um, owner in this field. They have um, several well-developed um, um, services like uh, Jupiter or um, others. Uh, Jupiter then is the uh, streaming platform of uh, public broadcasting um, with uh, extensive, extensive archive. And also last October, I think, two services were launched. No, actually the latter was a little bit later. Um, the um, um, library service of uh, e-books uh, where you can um, loan, um, rent, or not loan, or actually loan um, e-book and um, have easy access to it. And also the um, film archive uh, platform where you can have access to all the, e, uh, all the uh, digitized uh, film, uh, films from the past and its widenings. But where, uh, what I wanted to reach, I see I have, don't have much time left is um, what would be the common goal of the strategy explained in a very simple way. So we are part of the digital ecosystem and it's very similar to the uh, nature, to the ecosystem as we know it. And this is a hermit crab. Hermit crab is um, a sea animal who doesn't have a shell when it is born. So it's easy prey to everyone else. And what they do is they uh, use the shells of other sea animals to protect themselves. And um, in Digital Art Festival in uh, Namur uh, last year, there was a very nice work by um, Aki Inamata, which I think creates a very good metaphor of what we are trying to achieve. The title was Why Not Hand Over a Shelter to Hermit Crabs? And the, the idea is that the artist 3D printed um, those shells, which look like modern cities. Um, there were different of them, New York, Tokyo-like. Um, they look great, but the idea was that uh, on the left you can see there is an aquarium and a hermit um, crab was living with it. The shell was positioned next to it and uh, the whole idea was to wait until the creature, until the hermit crab, moves in to the uh, new beautiful uh, shell. And I think what we do have is we have, um, as a country, we have a pretty good e image. We have this uh, beautiful uh, shell of uh, e services, which some of them work very good. But uh, somehow, uh, our living creative culture has not uh, moved in to the uh, shell yet. And uh, also the shell is uh, the only thing which probably in the future can sort of protect it uh, to uh, help uh, local culture to, de to develop and uh, if needed. Uh, the hermit shell also moves to a new and bigger one. And so this is the point where we have to start to get our, uh, our crab into the uh, shell. Um, there are next steps to be taken, so I'm quickly just uh, browsing through them. Um, uh, but uh, what we really have started, and which will be launched soon, is the survey on uh, digital culture, what we do have, uh, how it can be used, 
what are the technological capabilities of institutions, and based on that study, to really take the first steps and address the real needs, uh, would it be in uh, gaming, heritage, or other fields of digital culture. And thank you. This is just a picture uh, I Dolly made when I asked uh, her or him to do it, and it uh, was called Heritage and Arts in the Age of Digital Culture. And basically what we had was uh, what the, the AI offered is a picture of a space which looks like a library with a, with a laptop. Um, um, why? Is it a metaphor? Is it something that the AI is suggesting us to do? That I would leave open at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carlo. Yes, again, it's, it's, it's not a shelter, it's not a shell, it's a souvenir. Now we are moving further with our program, and I'm really happy to invite here to, uh, our first panelists. Uh, and I apologize if you come here, please take your chair from here, not from there. And uh, first, Biden, uh, please, you can uh, come up. Oh, oh, you help. Okay. That's, um, Peter Hogwarts is a media innovator from Norway. Please uh, join the stage. Then we have uh, Erwin Laiho, virtual artist and digital fabricator at Design Factory in Aldo University. Please, you have a physical chair to choose. Uh, and, and last but not least, Peter Jalakas, our own grandman from theater and innovator in uh, different fields of, uh, of arts. Please have a seat here. So, and the panel, if you read uh, the program, I believe the panel is the reason why you are here. Because the only question I have, where is the money? How to become rich? When we had a discussion over uh, Zoom preparing this, uh, this panel, then Peter asked the question, why we are talking about the money at all? Because the rich Always, how to get rich doesn't mean that we are talking about money at all. Richness can be something totally different. But we will, uh, we will uh, definitely end up with something. How rich we will be in 45 minutes, it will be clear. But starting, and sorry, this is my disclaimer. I am totally dumb in, in this field, what these guys know very well. And starting with terminology. Maybe you were researched. What is it? What it was? N N N N T F N F F F ten. Right. What you are dealing with? Um, so there are these like digital objects, and I'm not going to go into the technological side too deep. But suffice to say that they're crypto cryptographically secured, and they can take the form of any type of uh, media content. They need not ha even have any media. They're just these entities that can interoperate uh, between users on the Web3, as, as uh, Indra Kimbrus earlier was describing. Um, basically, they're like certificates of authenticity. And then the media, like this artwork by Amir Falah, is uh, attached to that token. So the media isn't the object, but the object is the token. And then the media is attached to it. It didn't make things clearer, but okay. uh, it more confusing is when I looked in your web page, actually, you have a Sibelius monument in the metaverse. Mm, yeah. How it can be. Uh, so and I, it, it, you're using yeah. voxel technology for building that. Yeah, I, I love the... Um, it is voxel. Kind of like 3D pixel, so voxel, volumetric pixel uh, aesthetic, because it's kind of like similar to uh, Minecraft, essentially. I've, I've created a few of uh, my now digital sculptures with that technique, and, and they have uh, like conceptual story arcs that weave together different histories, as in the case of the uh, Sibelius Monument, which I did for uh, the Sibelius Violin Competition last year. And the winner of that got a uh, very highly regarded uh, violin from the 17th century master craftsman uh, Guadagnini for a loan for one year. And uh, I wanted to make a digital twin of that violin that I gifted to the winner so they could keep 
the violin in, in some format. And um, then the texture of the violin was made out of a, a photo I took of the bedrock underneath the de facto meatverse Sibelius monument in, in Helsinki. Yeah, it's really interesting form of, uh, of culture. Uh, uh, just the last question about the Sibelius uh, monument and, and violin. You cannot play on this one. No, you can't play it, but uh, in a few, uh, few hundred years you can't play the uh, actual violin either. So uh, this one at least will stay the same. It won't wear at all. And you have turned uh, these computers, actually, which are dead already, into art form, which remain for a, for a longer time. Maybe if you can open up this direction, why is this physical sculptures not making any, mm -hmm. any vortexes? Always? So um, both the digital and then the physical work, they're always uh, related to time and uh, especially looking at geologic materials. Uh, so I only use mineral materials in my work. I don't use any wood or any plastics or any fabrics, uh, only metal, stone, glass, things that uh, have a timeline vastly different from ours. And that's why I got intrigued with NFTs because it was uh, a way for me to continue commenting on this like deep time uh, deep time context of, of, of the digital age without having to fear that, that the artwork is going to you know, go, go out the window uh, in the first storm, but rather now it's in the blockchain for good. Um, and, and then the physical works, uh, they are basically making this very caveman type of point about how these objects are in fact uh, material first and then the cloud or the cybernetic connections or the metaverse, they are kind of, um, they're just expressions of uh, someone having a very serious server stack in, in their basement. So, th so there is nothing uh, a-physical about the internet, rather it is a like monstrosity of a physical uh, machine. Hopefully, I'm not sure if these uh slides with the work uh, were presented on the screens. If not, maybe then you can just put on, on the screens too uh, the examples of how this metal, I will not give my uh, computer to you right now, but it's uh, yeah. uh, and how <laughs> this will be used in the future uh, for, uh, for culture. Hopefully take good care of it so that it makes good uh, material for me later. Yeah. Yes, sure. <laughs> I'll hide it. <laughs> Uh, but to, uh, to, to be stick there with, with, uh, with the topic of this panel, Peter, what has happened to the society around us? Now we are talking about richness in a, in a different mood, a digital richness maybe, or a cultural richness. How you interpret it? The difference uh, between you, me, and uh, the people uh, raising up uh, the digital natives today is that uh, people are... Uh, in much bigger scale, uh, using their time on these uh, accessories as they are in their real life. Which means that uh, their user habits in uh, children today, don't, uh, they don't in the same scale, running out in the forests, playing games, climbing in trees and so on. They are sitting in the sofa, in their beds, in their good lounge chairs and, um, and being social in a parallel universe. Which means that uh, brands, broadcasters, everything, uh, and other things that's, uh, that's, uh, that they need to be a part of this change. So they, they need to, to, to be where the kids are today, to be visible and, and kind of adapting to their new, new user habits. As we can see is uh, that uh, today's uh, youngsters, they are having huge expectations of how things should look like. And uh, so it's uh, with, um, with like uh, traditional ways of interacting with people is, uh, is uh, in bigger scale, it's very hard to like uh, actually get access to those people. So we need to, to be on uh, their home court and on their premi uh, premises to, to like be, 
uh, be where they are. And there, uh, metaverse, virtual reality, gaming, uh, all those buzzwords and new things coming up now uh, is uh, playing a crucial role to like, uh, yeah, people need to adapt to that to, to, to get access to the coming generations in a bigger mm -hmm. scale. And that causes a lot of new opportunities, business-wise, new user uh, uh, habits, new ways of uh, creating new business models. There are totally new needs. And I think we need to separate uh, and think that uh, people don't live in a physical life uh, and a digital life. It's now blended together. And, uh, and, um, and uh, how you uh, dress and how you behave in the physical world are also, uh, pe people are having digital uh, identities as well. So uh, in some years, if we should believe Nike, for instance, uh, the big clothing brand, uh, they uh, sell a lot of sneakers digitally as well as they're selling sneakers uh, in real life. So what I'm, I'm trying to say is, is that um, it's, a, it's a completely new universe coming up, so to speak, and uh, that creates a lot of opportunities for uh, different businesses and, 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 and a way of reaching out to people. Thank you. And uh, Peter, you have been an innovator in theatre for uh, long before internet was introduced, actually. But uh, now we must live together with a new technology. Does the technology exist something new, or it's just business as usual? No, all for an artist, uh, it's, it's a very interesting time. But uh, well, it's hard to describe. I mean, you, can <laughs> you must show it. And uh, with a uh, with, uh, sculpture, it's, it's quite okay. You can show it also in the picture, but you cannot do it with the theater. So you but must maybe you can put the see. slides also here on the screen. But, uh, so I, well, uh, the slides are different because uh, they are not talking about theater. I was asked uh, to take a part in a panel talking about how to get rich with new tech. Hmm. So <laughs> I was really stuck with let that. Me, uh, sorry, so it I means that theater, you cannot get rich. <laughs> so, uh, let, let, me fin let me finish because, uh, yeah, exactly that. So my very short answer would be I don't have a clue. But as I was expected to say something more. So I, was, I, have, I also had a small discussion, small dialogue about it with uh, GPT-4, as, as Indrek had. So we came to uh, four uh, uh, things. And it was a bit surprising, because it's not only about uh, tech, but uh, talking about how to get rich, how to get rich nowadays. So um, we got uh, four points, and uh, um, I can um, to get rich with the new tech. They say you need to be more than just okay. You must be able to tell a tale of how you'll make the world prevail. People want more than just a thing. They want to feel how it will bring a change or solve a pressing need and make progress with lightning speed, and so on. I, well, I asked, uh, I asked her or him, her or him, <laughs> to to be poetic. So AI wrote some poems about it. But uh, so the first thing is storytelling. So you need, to, you, need to, you need to be able to tell a story. So this is the kind of first thing. If you want to sell something, so you must have a story. It's quite obvious. And then, second thing, uh, you must stand out. Uh, you must stand out. Um, you can wear blue lipstick, or, or you ha can have mm, yellow socks. <laughs> but people must remember you. Oh, that was the guy with, with the yellow socks, because mm. uh, they will remember your idea as well after that. So third thing, to be, uh, you must be informed. Uh, obvious, you must be informed what's going on around. And then, mm, not surprisingly also, to have mentors. And then, uh, in the end, uh, the GPT summoned it up in a way that... Um, and finally, keep in mind that wealth and success can be intertwined with a greater purpose and the need to make the world a better place indeed. So, <laughs> so <laughs> that was my kind of short dialogue with AI. Uh, and uh, I think it's kind of 
shows the path also if you are thinking about how to use this in, in art, uh, be uh, the art whatever it, it is, what form ever you, you're using. In the theater, I can imagine very well, uh, we are using it a little bit already with, uh, uh, as, uh, as AR, but I can imagine how to sell tickets and make contracts to, uh, as blockchain. And, and you see quite many different possibilities there. But especially for an artist, because you are kind of, uh, the world is opening up in a completely new way. And so there are new terms, there are new understandings. Although some, <laughs> as to get rich, seems to be quite, well, uni well universal in a way. <laughs> but uh, mm, anyway, this, um, this uh, new world kind of brings you many ideas. And also we are, I, I have a kind of feeling that we are also in the verge of, of completely new art form. I don't know what it is, but how, how we can even call. Because at the moment, those uh, NFTs, they are still just small pictures but I see so much more uh, possibilities there, I think. Uh, so this, that's uh, an interesting thing. I think uh, as uh, many cultural institutions, such as uh, museums, theaters, uh, music halls, and uh, also broadcasters, newspapers, uh, many people are having, uh, ref what I was saying earlier as well, having bigger issues in reaching out because now it's a competition of attention. And if you look at research, the, the last 20 years, it has been a increasingly uh, or uh, lower attention span in general in, uh, in younger, younger uh, people's life. Um, and this, uh, and as I also said, like uh, people are having huge expectations of how, how should, uh, things should look like. To, to, uh, so when you are scrolling through the feed, or, or, or it, uh, it's very hard to like getting out with uh, what you want to tell people. Which means that uh, the arise of uh, immersive technologies, which engages its audiences in new ways, leads to new waves of uh, art forms, uh, for instance, in theater uh, and movies. In, uh, they are now uh, experimenting with, uh, you can literally walk into, putting on your Oculus Quest, and you can walk into a live theater happening in the, in, in a, in a uh, alternative meta sp space. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of engaging, stepping into the scenery, stepping into a movie, be a part of the whole thing in a new way, which, uh, has been um, uh, harder to do earlier, so to speak. So, so it creates a lot of opportunities to, for institutions such as museums uh, to, tell, to tell their stories about the uh, uh, Second World War or uh, whatever, so to speak. You can step into the scenery, be there, learn, uh, learn and, and interact with the story in a completely different way. Or step into Hamlet and uh, be a part of the... the the Shakespeare uh, party happening, actually. That's quite, of, quite cool. Yeah, probably if we are talking still <laughs> about the theater. So in the theater, I think this, this, this specific moment is, is the thing you are mm, interested of because, uh, well, that's, that's the thing you share with the others. So you kind of fill it up, this moment, and um, those new tools give you so much uh, more possibilities to add more level, levels to this moment. So it's kind of enriched moment of life. Mm. Yeah, about the tension ec economy, which, uh, if not mistaken, the, the term was introduced some 25 years ago or so, when the, the main aim of the business is to get attention. And now there is so so big noise of every all kind of attract, uh, attractions. Mm -hmm. uh, I ask from Erwin how your work, creative work, will stand out from this noise. I'm, I'm not saying the noise is bad, it's a white mm -hmm. noise or, or so on, but there are so many attractors for the audiences, as you said, are, are using or spending less time, less attention to er anything. And that's uh, how you the yellow use socks? <laughs> yeah, it's the yellow socks. All my sculptures have yellow <laughs> socks also. <laughs> Okay, but in, in a digital no. world, it's very easy to make a copy of this. The cost of making a digital uh, copy of yellow socks is zero, meaning yeah. that in five minutes, all of these avatars sitting here will have yellow socks. What happens mm. next? Yeah. But some of them will remember they are here. <laughs> you know, that's the thing. Yeah, and then if, if you have, uh, 
like copies of the NFT made, they will exist on a different contract. So they're going to be immediately recognizable as replicas or counterfeit. That in the NFTs, there's really no issue of what's the original because you can't recreate uh, the transaction which already happened months back in time and, and e even, uh, uh, even at the very kind of like um, beginner level I think falling for scams where you're buying wrong token collections is rare that uh, you, you, can, you can fall into all kinds of social engineering and lose your money but, but buying the wrong token or being convinced that something is uh, legitimate or an original in the in the NFT sphere is uh, like not a consideration really. Um, but how do they stand out? Uh, well, I chose to do sculpture actually because as I was in art school, I realized that uh, like I'm actually like nonstop on the computer, that this is sort of ridiculous that I went here because I thought I'd be doing something with my hands and I ended up being just on the computer all the time. Um, and then the value of why would I want to make something with my hands in the first place and upon reflection of that, I realized that maybe, uh, maybe my, my sort of thesis is that um, as life gets increasingly more digitized, uh, it is more and more important to have material experiences which are uh, grounding and that uh, stand out because they have less competition, you know. So uh, my work's got like this, uh, very, you could say, um, like corporeal or somehow like uh, elemental quality, which which I hope is the is kind of the uh, hook uh, in addition to then the storytelling a aspect that uh, mm. Peter was talking about. I would like to ask from your side, it's, you are also working with the media, which is more familiar for, for me. It's, uh, nowadays, uh, it can be said that a lot of time spending is, uh, is about uh, uh, just spending time, entertainment time, uh, and, and so on. Not so, so much connected to consumption of culture, meaning going to the library for reading, or not going to the theater, or even not looking at cinemas, but just to, you know, on a TikTok, and, uh, 30 seconds, 15 seconds, the life spends a lot of, lot of, lot of uh, bytes, gigabytes, megabytes, terabytes are spent on, on a nothing. Uh, you as a scholar in this field, what's, what's happening now? Like uh, youngsters living in a, like a multiple platform uh, society, the biggest in Norway today for Generation Z, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, they're spending their time on Snapchat, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok. And uh, what that leads to is that uh, they are getting all their inputs visually uh, into to those, uh, in, in that, that, that channels, which causes that uh, the biggest way of news acquisition in Norway today is the news find me mindset, which means like the news are finding the kids instead of the kids going to the uh, home court, the national broadcaster of Norway, mm -hmm. or the national broadcast of Yle, or whatever, they expect expecting the news and the truth to come to them instead of they have to to find it themselves, which means that uh, that public broadcasters and and media companies having uh, in bi bigger issues in 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 reaching them because they need to adapt to the ways of uh, how people living their digital life, which means that they need to be more short, they need to be more snappy, they need to more, may be more visual sexy. It's not enough to, to run a paper with uh, black text on a, a white background today to get the attention from, from young, young people. So uh, what I think, if that's an answer to a question, it's, uh, it's uh, all those fragmentation in the, the, the way uh, digital natives living their life, uh, causing a lot of, of, uh, of issues considering um, level of trust as well. Because uh, when we now, uh, hopefully also needs to speak about uh, generative AI, uh, it's getting even more harder for people to distinguish what's real or what's fake content. So it's uh, a rough time being a, a, a broadcaster to get uh, the right uh, mm. attention 
and, mm. uh, and uh, create a trustful relationship with your audience today? If that was an answer to your question, I'm not sure, but... Uh, uh, yes, uh, the formulation of my question changed during yeah. the time, actually, I, when, when you uh, answered that. My, my a question related to this one is, you say it's, uh, the news must come to the yeah. audience. But, uh, if to switch the uh, word news to the culture or uh, consumption of culture, it meaning that uh, the audience will be pretty much a passive and will wait uh, when something comes up from a TikTok or a snapshot or so on. What, what's the role of the artist in this case? Just to wait there or, or to let the algorithm to decide what will be shown in, in a small screens uh, or to give away the power to, to decide about the consumption? It's, Will you jump? I think we'll give it away too. Yeah, <laughs> can I just jump that, that the artist isn't a, a, a marketer, at least in the fine art sense. Uh, the artist is just a creator, and uh, for like, let's let's not kid ourselves. Like nobody is a successful fine artist today if they don't have a gallery, uh, a, a, an agent, uh, advisors, possibly a marketing team, a social team. You know, this is, they, they, we're talking about like person brands. So the artist's attention, uh, the artist's um, job in relation to attention isn't to acquire it themselves, but to make the best work they can. And then they delegate the attention getting to others. And increasingly that others is also brands, like legit corporate brands. Uh, and other interesting aspect as well, like uh, where people such as Erwin, really great artists uh, have learned uh, the handcraft of creating digital renderings and uh, models and, and everything, like really going deep dive into the pudding, as we say in Norway. It uh, now caused by generative AI, it's uh, so democratized creating mm. digital content. So if we turn the topic of this discussion upside down, which how to get rich, we can also ask the question how to get poor <laughs> caused by generative AI, because all of now it's so easy accessible, I can go into an app that I have downloaded on my phone and in two seconds I get the most beautiful, uh, sexy looking uh, design profile, uh, mock-ups, I can uh, create uh, illustration photos of whatever I want. I could use an app to create an explain uh, video telling about uh, uh, a topics uh, that I've chosen with my voice, but it's generated as well. So you can now going into inst where uh, creative uh, like uh, design bureaus or, or, or other like kind of uh, creative companies earlier had had taken part of uh, yeah in the value chain, done a lot of different uh, work tasks. Now just one guy could click enter and uh, he has the title prompt engineer, which is a uh, quite uh, a new uh, way of working now, but uh, literally using your words uh, to de design things, which is, uh, is uh, creating a lot of opportunities as well. Uh, considering earning money, for instance, you can do more uh, with uh, less effort and, and less time. But on the other side, it's uh, questioning the, the issues of uh, what we appreciating of uh, quality and handcraft. Mm. So that would be really interesting actually to hear what uh, Irvin is. Yeah, and, but and the, the, the fantastic, I think this is a great overlap between the, the making money and the NFT uh, spheres, uh, obsession with uh, digital tools and then uh, the, the revolutionary uh, technologies with AI enabled uh, content creation. Um, but the prompt engineer is just a subcontractor. They're not a artist per se. They are the creative agency that you'd hire to do things based on your mood board. So yes, I think that there is uh, definitely like some economic reallocation, but I don't think it's a threat to the creative industry if we understand it as the, like, the, the, heads of, of brands or houses or artists. I ask help it's from hairy. our it's technicians. Is there is a, just one slide actually showing the AI applications available right now. If you could yeah. find this one, there was a, uh, many of them and it's, I already figured out that uh, I will just learn one of them, push a button and I became rich. <laughs> That's, but yeah, Peter, please. Oh, it's just, uh, the, yeah, this uh, GPT just being a tool 
Uh, I think we are, actually we discussed this before also, uh, uh, that uh, this uh, being afraid of it, it's a bit like being afraid of when, when this uh, digital photography came. So everybody was convinced that, okay, that this is the death of, of photography, so everybody can have now their photos and nobody needs a professional photographer. Mm -hmm. But actually it wasn't like that, so just you have a new tool. So I see the here as well, so it's not, uh, not that uh, all the writers will die, or copywriters as well, <laughs> maybe before them, but uh, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. It, it's, it's just a nice tool. Yeah, one, one take on, on AI that I loved was, uh, was some university professor who was uh, uh, looking at what ChatGTP would write for some of her assignments. And she said that, yeah, I'd, I'd grade these like good, that these would all be uh, around uh, C plus or to B plus texts, that there's nothing wrong, but there's nothing that makes me want to read them per se, that they, they, they are adequate and they, are, uh, uh, they get the job done, so to say. But because these models are trained on uh, quantity over quality, what you get is, in a way, uh, auto, like a robot that writes average quality stuff. So then if you are shooting for a higher level, you still need people to make it uh, above and beyond what like, the most of us can produce. I also did a test. Uh, I asked uh, this AI to write an uh, essay for my classes, actually. I think ah. It's roughly this B minus, and if to correct some mistakes okay. with references to the authors which didn't exist or uh, were not relevant for this one, which average student can do, then it's very easy to get the degree. Average. Mm. Mm. But what we are talking here, it's uh, something which above average. To be a creative means that you are not so average in, in, in this sense. And the slide, what you, it was just on a screen, one was just a couple of examples of applications available mm. right now for your creative work. You can do the music and visual arts and uh, script writing and, and so on, and that's a lot of learning to, uh, to do, a, do a stuff, Mark, uh, marketing, sales, and, and, and so on. The tools are there, but they will not guarantee uh, uniqueness, which is yeah. what we are looking for, actually, to be different from the average being above the... Uh, this one. But coming, uh, we're moving further with a question with trust, which was mentioned. Uh, that it's, uh, in, in some cases, it will be really difficult to make a difference. Uh, is it uh, real or is it deep fake? Is it a uh, person really speaking about it? And the first examples, if not mistaken, were some five, ten years ago already. But nowadays, uh, you can very easily to, to create uh, uh, piece of art, and I believe in, in your slides it, it's, it looks like a really nice uh, above aver average <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah, you, you had slides, if you could put a loop on, 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 on this, uh, this yeah. one. But yeah. then uh, being suspicious, uh, being a normal Estonian, meaning that everything is, uh, should be taken negatively and, uh, mm. and taking your warnings that there are a lot of fake things around, how I can trust use that what you showed just here is, is your work uh, well in NFTs specifically I'd, I'd like like to keep in that um, that's, that's my prestige or not, not my prestige but my, my sort of area of competence uh, in, in this so I'd say that the trust comes from your track record in web3 because there are some very successful uh, artists in the traditional uh, world or even big brands that clearly can pr produce uh, high-level objects, but then they might just come into the Web3 space as kind of uh, tourists. They just come to, you know, release a collection, see how it does, they don't really care about it. They're, you know, flirting with the idea of, of taking a bit more, uh, like, of their resources towards that direction. And then those uh, communities and collections end up uh, dwindling down, and uh, I'd rather take a, uh, I'd, I'd rather spend my money or place my bets or collect from uh, small creators being creating specifically on uh, NFT uh, platforms and uh, active on Twitter for the past two years, 
uh, than a big brand which has 20 years of experience doing amazing things in the real world, but then they are like making a small collection of NFTs because it's, it, I, I, I trust uh, their participation in this other arena as like proof that they're real. And I don't even care if they're pseudonymous. Uh, it's, it's okay if I don't know their identity or their government name. Uh, I can do with it just being a handle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Also thinking further that in, in a wider scope of creative industries so, and uh, considering design bureaus, for instance, I think uh, in uh, in uh, people will uh, still appreciate like high quality uh, made by real humans, and they will uh, come up with ideas that uh, AI couldn't because they they could drive it further and and taking inspo in a more uh, wider space, mm -hmm. uh, so to speak, and, and uh, yeah. Uh, anyways, I think um, uh, if you are uh, a guy or uh, a woman buying, a, 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 let's say, a, a new design profile, you could today maybe either do it yourself, uh, go into a, a generative a solution and, 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 um, and get it made there, or you can go to, a, to, a, to a, some great designers helping you do it, ERL. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the truth and, the, and the, the dilemma you are standing up with here is that uh, I think uh, one of the success factors for, for, for good creators is that uh, they want to be identified with their consumers and the consumers want to be identified with good people. In a, we, we need the human relations still. So it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's cool to like be identified with, uh, oh, who made this cool design you have here for your company? No, it, I did it myself, like under the table uh, in in my computer. I th mm. It's way more cooler to say, like, yeah, I used uh, AKA Studio in Oslo to make it, or something. It's way, way, uh, way more cooler, so to speak, to, to to be to be identified with great people, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, as uh, same uh, as Erwin, uh, we're, we're talking about, I think, like real artists creating real r real artwork is uh, still and gonna be appreciated. Yeah, and with the long game in mind. Exactly. C can we talk about uh, making money today versus in, in the next 10 years? Yeah, <laughs> because so uh, so th there was a lot of like really nice kind of, um, let's say, misunderstandings of the title of like how to get rich that each each one of us brought in like a kind of like different problematic to it and I think for me the biggest problem was like well are we talking about rich as if in t like earning um, 10,000 uh, before the end of the week or a hundred thousand in the next four years you know like what 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 kind of a, a scheme are, are we plotting here and I don't think both are possible to do. And uh, sadly, some artists have uh, firsthand uh, experienced this in NFTs when they get popular and there's, they're kind of like the flavor of the day. So then what they'll do is they'll uh, release a really big edition of works. They can do something called an open edition. So basically an unlimited amount with just a time limit, say you have uh, the next two days, the next 48 hours, anybody can mint this and it costs $200. Then you say, for example, you get uh, uh, 500 people to do that. So then you have what you have, uh, that, is it 10,000 then? So you did earn that money, but you also created uh, like an amount of tokens, which is multiples of all the artworks you had made up until that day in your life. And most people's market isn't going to be able to absorb that in a healthy way. So what happens is your artworks will uh, experience severe dilution of value. So all the stuff that was popular will become less popular because you just flooded your market. It sounds like really businessy and it's kind of nasty because I'm supposed to be talking about art here. But if we want to become rich, uh, even in the long term, just to have a healthy career, it's really important that artists are, are kind of safeguarding their supply, and that's one of the ways in which uh, galleries make a massive difference for uh, traditional artists, that, that the galleries are able to 
uh, kind of scope the situation with interest and organic growth so that they can issue works at a steady pace so your career is not moving too fast neither is it uh, sort of like having any of these relapse periods where you're not generating enough interest to keep up the existing supply. Meaning that you actually have tools to be a mass producer, that you can easily produce a lot for the millions. Yeah, and that's for you, sure. And meaning that the uh, value of the art piece will disappear. Yeah, then, then they become kind of, uh, as the edition gets bigger, and then they go from oil painting to a watercolor, and then they get to like a, like a screen print, and at some, some point they become a poster, and then they become a postcard, and then they become a stamp at the end. And, you know, if you have people paying multiple hundreds of dollars for stamps, uh, there's going to be issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's one Unless you're Damien Hurst. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, it's a, uh, one point uh, for a business, it's that there is no over delivery, that there should be a demand yeah. still, the demand should uh, still exist. The problem with demand is uh, how to get uh, known. That's uh, what we also already mentioned, that uh, uh, attention economy is something we, we should deal in. I have a question to all of you, uh, starting from Peter from now on. Uh, entry barriers. Uh, how this technology helps to overcome entry barriers, whatever field of culture, or maybe it doesn't actually help. Entry barriers, would you Yeah, see, then, if you would like to start something, it, to start a television station, it's, it's quite costly. Uh, to be, a, I don't know, violin player, it, it's, it's also very, very time consuming. You must learn a, decades. Well, but in a theater uh, if you are coming close to that point where uh, uh, it doesn't, well, everything's possible. So we will come very soon to question what do I want. If, I mean, if you can do whatever. So then <laughs> you come to question what do I do, what do I need. So you come to basic questions, uh, talking about art. So it's mostly about uh, love, death, and loneliness. So <laughs> you have those things, and uh, well, it's up to you what direction you want to go. I mean, probably you must have a computer. <laughs> Not necessarily, but uh, if we are talking about uh, this new tech, so probably you need one. But uh, well, it's if you're talking about art, so it's. Um, you, you can be creative in so many different ways, so that really there is no barrier, actually. I mean, yeah, if, if the only thing you can do really well is to work with a theater group, uh, then you must have a theater group. <laughs> <laughs> you can be a solo artist right now <laughs> that I don't have one at the moment. So, <laughs> yeah, so you must find something else then. <laughs> Okay, I, I, don't, I don't know how to answer this. What is the barrier? I don't even know. If, is there any barrier? You know, may, maybe there are not. It's, uh, maybe this uh, physical theater will be replaced to the virtual one. It's, it's very really easy to access into mm. uh, but, but any kind of... But uh, uh, Erwin, asking from you, is it, mm. uh, do you see any barriers? Uh, may, maybe this is just my imagination that there are some barriers exist to be an artist. That's a talent is the only uh, thing which is needed and that's all. Well, to be an artist, I don't think there's any other barriers except you need some, I think, some surplus time, some free time. It's, you have to be able to afford to do the art alongside whatever else you need to do to pay a rent, which is, which I think is the biggest barrier probably for art making, but specifically for NFTs, you have to be a little adventurous still because it's in the, it's so young so you have to kind of like um, you have to watch a lot of YouTube videos that may not have over 2,000 views and then uh, you have to be okay with the fact that it is very small and niche yeah you gotta kind of like go a little down the rabbit hole where most people aren't and for that I think is, is maybe the biggest issue I got no, <laughs> I got no one issue. I mean, uh, yeah, if you if you want to look toward, uh, um, well, theater, game, 
even cinema. So probably at the moment, what is the biggest problem here in this country, I think not only in this country, is uh, the lack of skills. I mean, it's usually a collective uh, art form, so you, you, there must be many people involved to, to, to get to a result. So then there are very specific uh, mm, lacks of people there, uh, like XR developers, and this, this, this is very, very clearly uh, mm, a big barrier. So otherwise, I think uh, people who would think towards this, those new technologies and how to use them in, in the art form, they very often they are not uh, good programmers, and they should mm. be also necessarily. They can be, but it's not the first thing. So, but uh, this, those technical skills are missing, so we must actually immediately start to teach people. Mm. So that's, mm. <laughs> that's a very... <laughs> I want to quickly give hope to somebody who isn't a coder that, that I'm not a coder either and that I know a whole lot of NFT artists who don't even understand how crypto works. It's a little worrying, but you don't need to understand the underlying technology to use it the same way you don't know how the Instagram uh, algorithm works or how the internet even works. Yeah, but it's, uh, yeah, yeah, if you're talking about NFTs, then yes, but um, if you're talking about how, how to use uh, XR, so yeah, like you need some kind of skills there. Yeah, <laughs> that that's if you sure. don't have them, so you never get to a result. So that could be a, a barrier, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, and what is yeah. your final advice for everyone? Actually, we promised uh, that in, uh, in uh, 30 seconds you will have the real, real, real essence how to become rich. And this is... Start uh, experimenting with uh, AI, mm. uh, taking uh, the step into the alternative virtual reality world, see what's cooking, uh, try to learn what's good in th those uh, areas and, and uh, see what uh, other big brands are doing and, and try to see what, uh, what's engaging your audiences uh, and build further up on that, I think is uh, a, a general advice uh, for that. And uh, to give uh, my, I don't have many seconds left here, but uh, <laughs> I would uh, take the opportunity to invite all of you and all of you and all of you home there to Bergen from 6th to 8th of June. Then we're going to have a, a, a future week where we are discussing all of those uh, topics and trying to answer this question in, in, uh, from a media uh, industry perspective. So... Uh, so, thank you, gentlemen. It's uh, what to, how to summarize. Learn, learn, learn. Who did say it? People in my age know it. Young people, luckily you, you don't know it. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, uh, one more thing. Uh, if you really want to get rich with this new technology, so one way is uh, you must uh, have your technology used as a standard. So this, mm. this is the way to go mm. if you want to get rich. Yes, thank you. Uh, just looking over the large audience, uh, how many hands raised, how many microphones, questions to the panel, because this is zero. Unique yeah. op opportunity to ask a question with, yeah, at least one. Thank you, hello. Uh, my question is not digital, but uh, Ebrus made a good example of physical table. How could you integrate NFTs into physical objects to create digital value for a physical object? I've been working on that for two years. Uh, I thought I would have published the white paper already today, but it wasn't ready. So <laughs> I have something coming out very soon. I'm actually making a standard, but I don't think it's going to become industry standard. It's going to be a <laughs> very, very niche open source uh, license, but yeah, work on it. Okay. Silence is golden. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thank gentlemen, you. and give a hand for... Maybe you can come up with these uh, real artifacts with... Uh, uh, for memory, and maybe you can make NFTs from these too.
Thank you. And we will move further, actually, if somebody taking a nose and you, you can smell money. Does anybody smell money right now? No? Uh, you should, because now we have a representative, uh, people coming in who actually represent investors, meaning that uh, there are some people who have money and some people who have invested into the arts and, and culture. Yuri, you are welcome. Hopefully I will be a richer after your presentation. <laughs> uh, well, if ideas enrich, then you will be wealthy, yes. No, yes, this uh, is also positive. <laughs> thank you. The stage is yours. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm Uria. I'm from Change Ventures. Change Ventures is a venture capital fund uh, that invests into ambitious Baltic founders. In other words, Estonian, Latvian, Lithuanian startups and, and their founders. We've invested into 31 startups so far. Uh, we have one unicorn so far, that's Verif. Uh, and, but I think we have another two or three coming quite soon. Um, so uh, we very much believe in investing into creative people uh, because the people that are running our startups are probably the most creative because they envision a world that is dramatically different from today. If their idea was something that is today, they wouldn't be successful. The whole reason why their projects are worth, well, like Verif, billions, is because they envision a future seven years from now but are able to build it today. And that's a pretty unique skill. Uh, in their own way, all of them are artists. Um, the introduction that I wanted to do real quickly is uh, a lot of people don't realize even the size of the creative economy. And uh, if we look at the United Nations latest trade conference, they said that this year we will hit one trillion dollars is what the creative economy is worth. It's 10% of the entire world's GDP. Uh, and it's growing twice as fast as other sectors. So in that sense, uh, we don't have to cry about, you know, oh no, you know, AI and NFTs are taking away all the artists' jobs. No, it's not true, quite the opposite. In fact, creatives have more jobs and are making more money than, than ever before. Uh, if we take it, the, Look at UK, obviously one of the leading sort of creator economies in Europe, then it's over 115 billion that the creative economy is worth in the UK. The, um, I don't know if it's a surprise to you or not, but the biggest part of the creative economy does come with software. Uh, the thing that may surprise a lot of you is of course the biggest part of software is games. Games today equal Radio, television, movies, books, all combined, and still games are worth more than all of them put together. Well, games is storytelling, right? Somebody has to write the story of what happens in the game. Games is constantly images, both still and moving images. The entire concept of how the story is told and what happens is all artists. So the games industry very much employs um, the creative sector and is only growing constantly. Um, interestingly enough also, if we look at all the sectors that we invest in as venture capital, then there's software. There's, for example, energy or healthcare or IT hardware. We're putting 14 times more money into software than into IT hardware, or medical technologies, or energy. So all our money is going into the creative industries. And the reason why it's there is because, well, the market. You guys are consuming it. You're the ones playing these games, you're the ones using this software, you're the ones that are demanding more from all the products than what we used to have very 1.0, very complicated, very ugly. People have learned as consumers also to ask for better artistry 
in the products that are made, both in the outside design, in usability. That's all artistry, actually, putting together a product that's a pleasure to use, a pleasure to look at, that has aesthetic qualities and all of that. Uh, that's a real skill, and that's very much in demand. Um, finally, I think uh, this is an area that is very much investing into humans. While the energy investments and the medical hardware investments and IT hardware investments and all the other sectors that VCs uh, will invest into and other investors, most of that money ends up going into hardware, literally. But when we're investing into software, we're investing into humans. And again, looking at the UK example, 2.1 million jobs, creatives uh, are employed in, in the sector, and it's growing at over 60,000 jobs per year, which is almost three times more than the other sectors. It is creating more jobs than any other industry. So again, we are very bullish about um, the creative industries. Now, since there was a discussion before about NFTs and things like that, I wanted to leave a little time to just sort of shoot from the hip and give some of my own thoughts or examples about this. Um, and, uh, well, my opinion of basically of the monkey pics, it's bullshit. It's, it's just shit, right? I mean, come on, get real. Uh, it's worthless. But, you know, people could have easily said that about the Lumiere brothers making the horse go round and around and around, looking at the first movie, right? Like, what the fuck is this? It's a horse. It gallops. Does it get anywhere? No, it just goes around. So it, so it just jumps. Okay, so what the hell good is that? When we look at the Lumiere brothers, with now, of course, we say, oh my God, this is an amazing piece of work, right? What a breakthrough in technology and in thought that you could do this. And of course, I don't know, films by Scorsese or somebody, I think we're dealing with a similar kind of thing. It's easy, you know, to make fun of the monkey pictures, not seeing sort of what the future could be and would be, uh, and the opportunities with the pictures. It is the very first sort of trials. It's the very first Lumiere brother moment, right? It is the... It is the Wright Brothers airplane that flew only like 70 meters and then gunk, right? We're not flying those planes anymore. But it was a great first attempt. So yes, those first attempts can be experiments. In fact, they have to be experiments. And it's okay for them to be totally bullshit. And it was great that some people ran like nuts and bought these things, right? Because it, it brought money to the sector. It brought people to learn how to do these things and begin to imagine what else it could be. So, you know, even things like, um, I, tried to, I tried to think of other examples, right? For example, uh, architects. You look at their little drawing, but if you just get a one JPEG of the house, could you build a house from that? Probably not. You're going to need down to the centimeter level all the measurements and all the other stuff and the files and everything that goes with that architect's drawing, right? So if you want that, you usually have to pay the architect to get the SVG file. So I think of these, the future in this area probably de developing along the same line. Yes, you can have the picture. Fine, there's the monkey. But if you want it, the actual value to unlock that, then you've got to have the real monkey, right? And the interesting thing that's being built around this is that if you have this real monkey, you, know, you can maybe walk up to a door somewhere in New York, show that it reads something from there, or you run that software, lets you into a private club. So it can be your key. It can be your business card. And because basically all of these NFTs can also, and are in fact, uh, contracts. They're digital contracts. The opportunities there for growing your fandom, growing your community, they've never existed before. 
Most artists I know are shitty sellers. Sorry, well, that's just what I've seen. Most artists are like, oh, just let me do my work, right? Don't make me go and like, push this and be the capitalist and the pig, right? No, I don't want to do that. I want to just make my work. You know, this is my inspiration. This is my stuff. I don't want to be the whore that's out there pimping this stuff and selling it out. Well, NFTs allow you to do that. Because in fact, you can code right into the NFT that, look, every time this picture is resold, I'll make another 10%. Or other rights, that if you want to make a movie of it, I get this much of a cut. If you want to make a play of it, I get this much of a cut. All of that can already be written into your art. And so suddenly the art itself becomes also the, the studio, the curator, the marketer, and everything else that you want it to be. So these opportunities are, are fantastic. So yes, I don't believe in just selling JPEGs but I do very much believe in the upside potential that this technology represents because it opens up business models and opportunities that have never existed before. And, and that's exciting. And that's something that, that we're looking at all the time as potential investments. Uh, I still have five minutes left, so I'll be happy to take uh, your questions uh, and, and I'll uh, answer on this topic or any other. Don't ask me how to get rich. I don't know. If I was, I probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> I don't. Hey, I a have portfolio, a actually. That's the answer. Have a portfolio. Oh, that was my question, actually. What should I have? Yes, you should have a portfolio. Uh, I have this leather pack. That's, that's a good start, but it's more the stuff that's in there. You got to have lots of stuff in uh, there. What is needed in there? Uh, a bunch of bets. And that's what an uh, investor's portfolio is. Um, because we invest in such risky things uh, that, in fact, statistically, 50% of the projects we invest in will go bankrupt, broke, we'll never see that money again. May I uh, ask Peter a question? I, I know that you have a plan with virtual X, uh, yeah, XR reality, this kind of lab or platform or uh, this kind of new space, which needs a lot of money. Yes, that's true. Yeah, so, and here is the money. Please, have a dialogue now. I, I think... Well, uh, if, uh, if we <laughs> agree that I will pay in this 50 what you don't need back, so <laughs> we have a deal. That's the, that's the problem there, that uh, it's very hard to, to understand myself. <laughs> Where does the value come from? I mean, it's mostly about uh, teaching, about education, and about art. But uh, it's very hard to, to kind of um, find this add-on there, why well, one uh, should invest in it. Very specific examples of where this technology is already making money. For example, historically, there's always been, with art, it's the question of provenance, right? Did Picasso really paint this? Was this really Renoir, you know, etc.? Well, with digital art, that's solved. And in fact, you can retrofit, you can use this sort of blockchain technology, which is essentially just a list of all the prior owners, right, in its most simplified form. You can tag any piece of work and have literally the entire history of every owner that's ever held this piece of art. In addition, we might eliminate the horrendous issues we've seen during wars when occupiers during World War II and other times, or for example right now during the war, are going and taking away people's art, claiming it as theirs. You know, it's war loot. Well, if you have a digital history of all of this, it's prima facie evidence that this is mine, this was stolen, right? You weren't put into the blockchain as a buyer, as a rightful owner of this. So this might uh, really help and generations in the future of people to get their rightful art back. Just an idea. You know, they're doing this also with blood diamonds, you know, to make sure that you actually know where do your diamonds in your ring or your earrings or necklace come from, right? Was it, you know, from Angola or was it mine somewhere else? You can trace these things on the blockchain. Uh, just some of the ideas that are working, you know, as we speak already, you know, as excellent uh, blockchain technologies. But, you know, there's 
more and more and more that we could do. Really, I mean, our driver's license, look at, does it make sense to have, or, or a COVID pass, you know, a printed out piece of paper? That's the cutting edge shit now? That's, that's the best us as humans, seven billion, eight billion people, is a printed piece of paper to say I have COVID or not? NFTs are clearly superior to that. If you had an actually verifiable, easy, quick, universal, in every country, NFT that you could check, you know, we'd know exactly what shots you got, whether you were sick, etc., etc. Same with your driver's license, same with your fishing license. So there's a lot of uses for these technologies. Unfortunately, a lot of attention, of course, goes to monkey pigs. But hey, that's how it is. <laughs> I can buy the part of copyright and decreasing the limits of bureaucracy and all, all this kind of stuff. But in the beginning, there should be a creativity uh, to, to have a copyright attached to something. That's the point. And what we are looking here, what is the beginning point, actually? Where is the monkey? Who is the monkey? How it's... That's, that's the point. That's the blockchains and everything. To, to be sure that this is mine, that's perfectly... Fine, and even valid uh, driving license or a COVID pass. These are these kind of bureaucratic issues. I mean, well, what about wait, what do you think about, for example, uh, the new technologies that allow brain scans to guide computers? So here's people who are quadriplegics Again, or paraplegics creating art, even without the use of their hands. In my just brain, with their in my brain, what is missing is creativity, and I don't want to have this computer scan brain saying there is no creativity at all. No, no, no. I'm saying a, a human that's a quadriplegic or a paraplegic in a hospital can I, actually create digital art now by thinking about the art in their head, in addition to being able to talk to their nurses and doctors saying, hey, I'm really thirsty. Okay. I am thirsty and we have a coffee break now. <laughs> that's fair enough, fair enough. But thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Let's be back in, uh, sorry, I have lost my computer brain and it's 25 minutes. How much time we have for a coffee break? 15.45. 15 meaning that exactly 15 minutes, if I'm not mistaken. So, please don't leave the building, stay here. We will have a second panel and more presentations about very interesting topics. Thank you, so far. So, nice to see you again. It has been a while. But let's continue. It's, mm, said actually, after this kind of breaks, there should be some kind of jokes that which will <laughs> wake you up. But I am not a good on, on this one. And Are you looking at me? Yes. On jokes? No. Maybe. <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry. It's, it's, it's a, again a bad Estonian joke, <laughs> but uh, I'm really happy to have our nice next speaker here, Idun, and I read your biography, but it's, it's much better than you introduce yourself saying these three more most important elements which will introduce you to this crowd. Ah. Who are you? Uh, I have a background in media studies. I worked for many years in an interdisciplinary um, research lab at the University of Oslo in Norway. And what I love the most is maybe projects that combine seemingly contradictory fields, such as in this case, cultural heritage and artificial intelligence, and then finding 
uh, fruitful contradictions in them. Yeah. Yes. Now this <laughs> physical world and also the virtual one on YouTube is yours. Please. Okay. Thank you, thank you. And thanks for inviting me. Uh, and thanks for all the nice talks so far. It's been really interesting. Um, I'm really happy to talk about these projects, both the um, aspiring ac researcher in me, the designer in me, and also the activist in me. As you will see, there are a bit of um, activism in my projects. Before I go into the main topic of my talk, um, of what I've termed the potential of artificial ignorance, um, I will show you a few examples of previous projects to place myself uh, more as an initiator and co-creator of interdisciplinary projects uh, rather than an expert of a particular technology or field of culture. I was a bit afraid when I said that I was supposed to be an expert of something. <laughs> I'm not. I'm good at combining different people's skills. Then Maybe that's my field of expertise. So, some previous projects. This is a um, co-curated traveling outdoor exhibition dealing with the Second World War uh, and the Norwegian war sailors and how they cope with their PTSD, post-traumatic uh, stress disorder. Uh, and in this traveling exhibition, we use kind of like everyday digital media, such as social media and QR codes, but the way we do it, or the way I did it, uh, I think had an impact. Um, it enabled common people as curators allowing them to set up this exhibition as curators in their home community. And it also allows um, you to listen to the now all departed war sailors inside your own phone and private space through the QR code. This is another uh, example. Uh, it deals with more advanced uh, technology of immersive sound. And the point here is to experiment with and suggest an alternative stage for electronic music and art. Because what do you do when uh, your piece of work is 12 minutes of an intense sound experience or a multimodal uh, dance performance? I don't know if it's possible to scroll these things. Well. You get it. It's an uh, immersive sound and just a mock-up of uh, uh, what could have been a more expensive, of course, stage for uh, electronic art and music. The next project is, um, is also exploring uh, immersive experiences, but in a different way. This was a collaborative project uh, with the architect and artist Jules Pluma, combining these cheap cardboard VR goggles, 360 video, high quality recording of sound, um, 3D graphics, and a live stream uh, in order to run an international music festival during COVID. Depending on the collaboration between the visual artist and the band, it could look a bit like this or like this, or um, you could be surrounded by your favorite band, in this case, Almendra, uh, at the very location where they have developed their art and music the past years. Airplanes and birds flying above, adding to the intimate and authentic experience. So instead of the physical festival that I've been also uh, initiating, together with uh, my partner, it's, uh, it has a limited audience of 250 people, whereas this uh, 360 video has been viewed many, many, many times, 30,000 times. That points to a potential of digital technology, obviously, in culture. Now moving on to the project on artificial intelligence. Um, this project, the prototype Mai Pruskunst in Norwegian, in English, Me Plus Art, 
dealt with uh, visual art, art museums and young people trying to find novel ways to overcome alienation towards art. Also tried to make young people reflect on the value of art as was referred to earlier today. Um, back in 2019-2020 where we started this project, it was a heated debate in my hometown about public funding uh, for art. Uh, connected to the building of a massive new art museum. And it was one of the reasons why the self-claimed nationalistic party was became the third largest political party in that election, which was scary for a lot of people. So back to the project uh, or the prototype. What you see here is the landing page of the web app where the user is encouraged to explore how art may say something about you or the society you live in. The app connects to the smartphone's camera and you can either take a photo of your immediate surrounding or upload a photo of your, from your library. Your photo is then compared with the art collection and displayed together with what the artificial intelligence consider its nearest neighbor. Instead of uh, I's ability to create content, as we talked about a lot earlier today, um, I'm more interested in what artificial intelligence sometimes are criticized for. That it is self-taught and ignorant, that it lacks expert knowledge and contextual understanding, and therefore do not understand the difference between a private photo uploaded from your phone and artworks from an art collection. In the academic work that followed this uh, pilot, I argued that artificial intelligence, as it was used in this project, has the potential of creating absurd connections, um, create wonder, prolong perception, uh, and direct attention towards formal elements of visual art, and thereby foster a growing ability to approach visual art, which also was the purpose of the project. In the article, I add up the influential French art philosopher Jacques Derrida, no, not Derrida, Jacques Rancière, as you may know. Uh, his ideas about symmetry and the concept of the ignorant schoolmaster and the emancipated spectator to artificial intelligence. And it is this uh, exploration of artificial intelligence understood as an ignorant master emancipating the spectator in different ways that I have continued in the ongoing project on intangible cultural heritage. Folk music machine in Norwegian, in English, the folk music machine, referring to machine learning of artificial intelligence. This is the anthology where my article was published. It's open access, but it is in Norwegian. Uh, and the name of the anthology is The Purpose of Art. So, like visual art, traditional folk music may be perceived as strange and alien to people outside the field. In addition, traditional folk music as intangible cultural heritage is vulnerable. In order for such intangible cultural heritage uh, not to die out, it relies on those who practice it to carry the tradition forward. That is why recruitment is essential, to be able to keep the cultural traditions alive. Uh, this, this project started off as an interdisciplinary project collaboration, trying to find fruitful contradiction, as I referred to at the introduction of myself, between art, artificial intelligence, and the intangible cultural heritage of folk music. The goal was to explore novel ways to overcome alienation, to build a sense of local identity, to explore traditional folk music ability to create a sense of togetherness with people across cultures. Projects such as this, I can uh, just refer, this is me writing, and then it's an influential 
practitioner on the right, um, a researcher on artificial intelligence and music, and a um, contemporary artist. And we're all kind of developing novel ideas of how to communicate folk music. Such projects. Developing what does not yet, yet exist is about dealing with uncertainty. And we do so through uh, workshops such as this, through prototyping and testing. We set the workshop in the middle of an um, ongoing art exhibition. Uh, and we did that to uh, communicate very clearly that uh, we are not attempting to replace the tradition um, or heritage. This is related to an aspect of working with cultural heritage that it also uh, is very much about trust. In the following experimentation and testing, we explore the potential of artificial intelligence in various ways. And as with the um, project on visual art, artificial intelligence here may be said to also create wonder, prolong the perception and direct attention towards formal elements of the traditional folk music. The cultural heritage has this pupil-master relationship. And in a way, the artificial intelligence then take over the master role. So what happens is that you either alone or together with other people uh, get the chance to touch this piece from cultural heritage, the fiddle, try to make sound. And that sound is then um, used to search into the archive of cultural heritage. Referring back to you from the Ministry of Culture, we have all these archives of cultural heritage, but we don't know how to use it. Maybe you can use it under like thinking in terms of Rancière as an um, ignorant schoolmaster. So this was obviously the test. Now when I'm developing it, it will be more hidden that you will only, your interface is the fiddle. And then it just, it automatically responds with the nearest neighbor. I don't know if there's anyone here who can play, but uh, these fields are often very marked by expert knowledge. You should hold the fiddle in this certain way, or there's so many things you can do wrong, but in this case, you're allowed to do whatever you want to, hold it as you want to. This is more the VR experimentation. What happens is that although you obviously can't play, you are given the opportunity to curate the space in a way. And you feel a sense of pride when this beautiful folk music fills the room. Plus that you of course start to compare your uh, sound with the professional music. So it's the latter prototype where young people, old people, skilled, unskilled, are given the opportunity to touch and play the traditional fiddle, fiddle, triggering the folk music archive's nearest neighbor, and in a way curating the collective ex exploration in the public space that I'm now exploring further, alongside an online interface for more skilled practitioners. And this is not an easy task, I think, uh, but done rightly uh, or done in the right way, it can maybe strengthen a vulnerable, intangible heritage and also at the same time perhaps democratize knowledge about a technology that 
is surrounding us in an increasing way, artificial intelligence. You can just read this as my time is moving out. There. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. We can continue from here and I, I would like to invite here our uh, panelists uh, uh, joining us, Idun uh, Onestein. It will be designer Xenia Jost. Please, Xenia, come here. We have Rain Zobel. Rain, where are you? Ah, oh, here. Yeah, just here. And then we have also Eglerask from, <coughs> from Blu-ray company. Uh, Joining the panel, please. Oh, I have, oh, I have this kind of uh, throne, uh, Game of Thrones, yes. Okay, here we are. And the title of the panel is Transition Based on Digital Culture, Media, Fashion, Tourism, Games. Is it added value? And is it sustainable? When we had pre-discussion uh, over the internet, and actually I was terrified uh, with, with Xenia's statement, uh, or I, I, I will not repeat it, but if you remember the moment, and we talked about fashion, fashion sustainability, and that it got uh, somehow very depressive. Yes, indeed, it is. I usually love more to motivate people and you know to see the bright future and maybe this is a good ground to start from because fashion is really in depressing state right now so it's not very How hard come? to see the, the brighter future uh, so the mainly the most important what i do believe is that we we overproduce so much of, of pieces of, of, of clothes of, of accessories and it's not uh, actually only the problem of, of fashion business it's in the food industry it's everywhere so it's um, it's because of all the economical system that that we use today uh, that uh, to to gain more money we need to sell more to sell more we need to produce more and as um, as uh, the customers would like to pay less each time, so it's it's become really, really like a huge problem. It is. It's not. It's not becoming. It is a huge problem. So it's just that um, I will not go deep with the numbers, but just to illustrate it that if we stop the fashion production today, we will still have six years close to wear each of us. So it's it's really it's really bad. And mostly what happens is that the the pieces, made pieces, are landed somewhere. Uh, they're burned somewhere, or they're in the landfill. So it, it's causing a lot of CO2 problems and, and you name it. So there is only problems that I see. And as a fashion designer, it's, it's my huge problem as, as, a, as a designer, as a professional designer, because I'm, this is how I think, this is um, how I believe a designer, all designers are thinking that we are solving the problems. We are, we are the people who are, who are uh, finding the problems and then they're finding the solutions to the problems and the fashion designers each each style I produce is like making more problems it does not it, it, it creates more problems it does not actually it's not a solution at all so that's why I started to look into digital digital tools and and digital fashion to discover is there any options and possibilities to create fashion this way that you don't need actually to produce physical pieces because uh, the truth is that people do not buy clothes because of the need of the physical need I mean so if it's like to be honest you need two pair of trousers one that you have in your washing machine another that you wear so everything that is above this it's not physical need anymore it's emotional need so and I was I'm, I'm exploring is there options that we could somehow uh, buy things and get this emotional good feeling without actually needing to buy physical things and this way we don't need to produce so many physical things because in in fashion people are buying you know things because they're too cheap because you know I 
I like the color, it's not because I wanted to wear it. It's not because I will wear it 10 years after that. So usually people today nowadays are buying because of just another reasons and they don't use it later on. So those are huge problems. And that's why, that's why I, I found uh, for myself uh, digital fashion and exploring it and would love to see what, what is there to help out with the situation and still to be fashion designer and to be optimistic, not, not, uh, <laughs> not this kind of a fashion designer people are scared of, you know. So, yeah, this is, this is my story. Yeah, it was a really fasc <laughs> fascinating story about fashion. Uh, it's, it's my, my question <coughs> is, you say that we need actually two pairs of trousers. Uh, Yes, that's true. In a virtual world, actually, you can change a lot in, in every second. You can have a, your avatar can wear whatever. In physical as well, you can change everything. Uh, in physical, <laughs> it's, it, it's a little bit more difficult. Uh, of course, uh, there is a budget limitation on this one, but what I'm referring is that in a digital world, you can create even more stuff, which might be not so sustainable. If you are your creation, if it can be shown again, the slides, uh, these virtual uh, fashion examples, very, very nice, and these are pieces of art. Uh, I, Thank I, you. I admire these, but it's, it's easy to use, uh, to overconsumption uh, might happen. Yes, I do believe that this risk is with everything, you know, you can use too much food or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. and I believe it is a problem nowadays, it's a huge problem that we, we do so, we do overconsume everything. So even the relations, you know, between people, which could be like much more sacred. So, but yes, of course, it's, uh, there is a dangers, a lot of dangers. And I, I believe that unfortunately we will discover even more and more dangers that we don't see and understand today in, in digital world. So it's just a matter of time, isn't it? So, but still being afraid of dangers in future, I think it's not a good approach to stop thinking about brighter future. So I would love to think it this way that we try to explore, try to find the solutions and and, and of course there will be dangers. Yeah, I, I totally agree to work with, with you. We But we there will be something to work with. Isn't yeah, it? exactly. <laughs> to overcome. Is something, uh, I believe there is a huge potential which is misused or less used, uh, how to put it. And I just have a thought about uh, Idun, you said you, you are using this National Archives heritage and music. But maybe there are, but maybe there are millions of photos about fashions films and so on, maybe have this kind of same collection that I would make, make a picture of myself and see how, uh, I don't know, king, uh, kings in meet mm -hmm. <laughs> evil, uh, evil times, something where some similar like me and uh, to reuse, to, to take this uh, heritage back to life again. It's not only in the music, in the fashion, it might be, I don't know, something else. Mm. Oh. When you say that, I'm thinking that it points to maybe another turn that uh, the digital technology will help us create. Because then you would have an archive, you wouldn't consume it in a regular way, you would kind of use it as a creative tool. So yeah. instead of this consumption, consumption, we, are, we should um, maybe have a different turn than, for instance, South Korea's consumption, on having used a lot of culture and art in, in their development of digital technology, we should, Nordic Baltic region, maybe should have a different take on it to make people uh, subjects and uh, create uh, creators, not consumers. Mm -hmm. So in your case, when you suggested this, oh, you have a whole archive available, uh, let's make people able to create something. Yeah. Not, yeah. not constantly consume Consuming, something. yes. Uh, <laughs> I believe that uh, we, ha we haven't heard majority of the songs created uh, during the history of humankind. Uh, that's m most of the culture is unconsumed uh, during the centuries. Is it, is it fashion or is it music? Is it books? Mm -hmm. we, we, we consume a really little, little, little part that has been there or is archived in, uh, in the museums and uh, libraries and so on. But moving further, it's, uh, something has been lost or destroyed during the history, and you are giving uh, new ways or opportunities to join the history again. Uh, yes. Now we are talking about Blu-ray. 
Now we're talking about uh, Blu-ray and uh, yes, our passion is uh, to visualize history and uh, we use the modern technology to do it. Uh, so, for example, in Estonia so far we operate uh, two time portals, one is in Tartu and one is in Toila, and we show uh, buildings and uh, moments uh, that uh, have been destroyed. Uh, and um, I really loved uh, Irun's uh, word for the AER, that it's uh, ignorant. Uh, uh, as we are developing uh, right now a third um, attraction, uh, we are doing uh, Tallinn in uh, 1939 and 44, so two years. Uh, one is uh, before March bombing and uh, the other is after that, uh, how Harju Street uh, looks uh, now and uh, in the history. And I tested uh, the image uh, AR for the content as uh, we have uh, put uh, lots of uh, working hours uh, into our models. Uh, and I would say that uh, I discovered the same thing that if you are talking about cultural heritage and authentic history, then the AI is quite ignorant uh, today and uh, you don't get uh, the precise uh, visuals uh, what you need because our time traveling uh, journeys are very precise we are doing uh, it uh, for example in Toila it's uh, July it's 1938 so it's a uh, precision with a month and uh, in that uh, area AI doesn't know what you have to show yeah, ignorant teacher, as Idun said, it's uh, hopefully AI will learn uh, fast and we will be able to, to change. Taking this cultural heritage into life, this, this has been something which has excited me for many years already. It's the first experiments are quite old ones. Um, not even in the virtual world, but we have seen, uh, for example, uh, old town of Narva made from uh, paper, and which has it's a model of Old Town Narva, which is very exciting, and in your technology, you can walk around, hopefully, in on some day, inside of this Old Town of Narva again, as you said about Toila or, or Tallinn or the other, other spaces. But the tricky question here is, you, you mentioned the time slot, saying it was 24th of June in 1938, and you are writing history, you are making history. But somebody can, I'm not trying to say that to misuse or to say that to make the history that didn't exist. But do you feel that you are responsible for that? No. <laughs> uh, well, our idea or where our storytelling is based on is uh, that uh, you have to tell your own story. We tell the story of Estonia, our history, because uh, if you don't do it, uh, you don't do it for younger generations, then uh, as uh, current uh, day shows, that there will be someone else who will tell the story. And uh, as our core of team is uh, historians, uh, then authentic history is very important for us. So the views or the information that we don't know, we leave uh, it out, so we don't rewrite it. Mm, okay. Mm, yeah, the so storytelling is also fascinating, but you are not uh, Orwell 1984 rewriting the story on a daily basis, as Putin doing right now. But uh, Sorry, it was a uh, bad connection. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can uh, give you an example with the development of uh, Tartu, where we did the year 1913. So, uh, to do it uh, in uh, VR, uh, we looked uh, in the archives more than 20,000 photos, and uh, we searched for secondary information uh, also, because uh, what we discovered, that in the archives, uh, photos can be dated with the same year, but uh, one can show you the river Emayogi and the um, uh, streets uh, before renovation and one after renovation, and then you have to discover what's the actual view from the 1913. And uh, with Tartu, we were very lucky that we had uh, revision documents uh, where during the 
change of the century, they recorded the colors and materials of the buildings and what businesses were inside of the buildings. So this is how we work and uh, how we search for the information so we don't invent the stories. Mm. Yeah, my imagination flows that you can go to the uh, shop in 1948, open the door and see what kind of dresses uh, were where and what kind of music was uh, playing in, uh, in, a, in a courtyard. But uh, take a time travel uh, to the future, Rain. How, how strictly you are connected to the past? Um, we are also creating a historical uh, year, but uh, with a little bit of different perspective. Um, we are creating a virtual reality survival game called uh, Bootstrap Island. And um, we, what we are trying to do is to put people into this um, fictional setting inspired by Robinson Crusoe and Treasure Island and other classical novels. And uh, through virtual reality, <coughs> not only observe, but also let people using motion controllers to actually interact with the environment to, to use the real life skills of how to open up a coconut or, or make a fire or keep some angry animals away and uh, and also um, since we're talking about sustainability the 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 main gameplay of the game is to to use your very scarce resources in a very smart way so uh, kind of to put our Estonian experience into it as well, and uh, we are the first Estonian game to receive support from the European Commission uh, through Creative Europe, uh, which is of course nice because uh, funds for actually making a game are very good. <laughs> you kind of need those, uh, but also uh, as it's a sort of a validation that what we are doing is is somehow um, valuable and uh, and uh, that we actually know what we're doing. What kind of game it is? Actually, uh, personal disclaimer, it's, uh, I'm fighting against uh, game playing because I have grandchildren spending too much time on, on a gaming at Fortnite and all this kind of stuff is from a Satan, I must say. But uh, Well, the bad part about regular gaming is that you don't get any physical activity while doing it, right? So when you put on a VR headset and you actually have no, you to are, use you your... You are moving your... Yeah, finger. you're not moving that much. Uh, <laughs> but when you're actually using motion controllers and you have to wave your hands around and actually use your physical body uh, and, and your physical body is, is part of the experience, then, then it becomes uh, really something else also. I mean, as, as, as some, some people use virtual reality as uh, exercise machines as well. Uh, that's not our goal, but uh, it definitely creates a new type of experience. It's very interesting with virtual reality that even people who say that they have like no experience with games and they have no experience with technology and they don't know anything about that, when you put on a virtual reality headset, then instantly they sort of assume what, how it works. Like uh, they in instantly want to use their hands and they want to pick, if they have hands, then they need to pick everything up and they, assume that everything reacts and that they, when they touch uh, a tree branch, then the leaves move and, and when they wave to some human-like creature, then this creature actually waves back and, uh, and sort of our brain automatically assumes certain things. And so we, we have the humble task of, of um, creating a game where everything that you expect that will work will work in a realistic manner. Yeah, it, it works. I have I have tried it, and I felt from a cheer when uh, running on a roller coaster, and it it was a ridiculous uh, view for a, for the audience actually sitting and just <laughs> filling around. Have you uh, experienced with your uh, devices uh, in Oruk uh, Park, for example, that somebody tries to touch something? Uh, tries to touch and uh, for example in uh, Tartu we place uh, people in the middle of uh, River Emayagi to show the old uh, stone bridge uh, that has been uh, destroyed and uh, once we had a visitor who ran uh, 10 meters and then when she came back she said that um, she can't swim and she just wanted to get on the shore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
This is something our brain uh, yeah, needs to get used uh, to, to these environments. Xenia, have you experience uh, from this audience or how to say, customers or clients? Uh, they would say, that, oh, this dress doesn't fit, make it a little bit uh, tighter. You mean in, in digital world? Yes, not, not in really. digital world, yes. <laughs> yes, not really. Uh, so about the customers in the, in the digital fashion world, there is um, different approaches, of course. And one of them is to put, a, for example, to use it in the social media. So it's um, technically not very um, complicated to put it as a filter on the photo then. And if you do so, then, you know, it's not, it doesn't need as many, you know, the fitting is, is much, much easier, so not really. And, and with, uh, with the avatars, for example, in um, uh, the Central Land, where I participated in the first uh, uh, fashion week, um, Metaverse Fashion Week, there and uh, with avatars is the same. So you have a file, you have the information, and, and, and there is no such problems as you have in, in the physical world. So, but if uh, you want to go even deeper, for example, if you use uh, digital fashion uh, technologies to produce physical things, which is possible today and uh, widely used already, uh, that means that you can um, do the first uh, samples, prototypes, uh, uh, digitally, so you don't need to produce them physically. Uh, and uh, then the technologies, so you can... Um, you can fit it uh, on the different sizes of the model and you can resize, it, resize those clothes and so on. So actually you can put your own size inside and see the, um, the dress that will be soon physically made, how it will look on you with your sizing. So uh, yeah, there is a lot of opportunities and I must say it's, it's easier than in the physical world because there is much uh, less work you need to do. and. Um, of course, technically, to do digital fashion today, you need a lot of skills to do it, and it, it takes a lot of time. So sometimes people assume that it's super easy that you'll do one dress like you can do it immediately. It's, it's like hours and hours and hours of work. Uh, probably soon it will be easier and faster. Yeah, but still, even if I compare with physical fashion, in physical fashion you need a team of technologies, of constructors, of the seeming uh, the ladies who will sew it together. You know, there's like so many, much, much more people needed, and then usually the samples are made in one country and the fabrics in another country, and you need to send it there, and then you need to send it back. So the process could be like till six months to produce a sample, like the right sample. Uh, and in, in digital fashion, if you if you could do it alone, I can do it alone totally, and I can do it like in a couple of days. So this way, it is easier and faster and cheaper, of course, as well, and not so so wasteful as in uh, physical production. In the morning, uh, not it was morning. It was a lunch uh, first panel. Uh, we, we touched uh, the issue about skills needed for artists yes. or culture. What kind of skills are needed? You are representing different areas of cultural industry. Um, do you have uh, some kind of common dominator which, which is really needed in, uh, in your daily work life? And uh, people listening and watching us on, on YouTube who don't have yet the skills, what kind of skills they must have in the future to survive? Making a fire was a one, yes. <laughs> Me and Negla, we have the same answer. We, we need more developers. Um, and, uh, but and my developer, who is the developer? And it, it's, it's not a good, good word to say programmer, because uh, a developer is, is, is more than a, pro, uh, than a programmer. They don't just need good math skills, but they also... I mean, all the, all the developers in, in Model VR are, uh, are really creative people, uh, like much more creative than you would expect out of uh, people who specialization is, is basically programming, uh, but we have a really big lack of, uh, of developers and game developers in Estonia because uh, they are not uh, formally educated in Estonia. They are either self-taught or they have uh, taught something, uh, they have been learning something completely uh, different and then they have turned to game developing. So that's a big issue actually in Estonia. You yeah, agree. I can second to that, uh, but um, if I speak about our company, then um, 
uh, a big part is uh, historians because uh, if you think about history, very common uh, mistake is to think that uh, everyone can uh, interpret uh, history, but if you don't have the knowledge and background uh, to put the things what you see or read in the system, uh, then you get a totally wrong picture from it. So we also need uh, historians, but yet yeah, developers, uh, 3D generalists, uh, because uh, our views have to be as photorealistic as possible. So that's uh, what we need and uh, what we are lacking if we are searching for new team members. I'm, I'm still confused, actually. <laughs> Being a fashion designer in the in future, the advice is start learning coding. Uh, not really, uh, not at all, because uh, being a fashion designer actually don't need to code at all. It's uh, like, of course, you need to learn programs, but even, um, even let's say so, 10 years ago, there was still the fashion designer in the production. Production designers, I mean, not the atelier designers, they needed to know different design programs to work with. So it's. Um, but I think being a fashion designer, which is the most important that we, n we need to have is curiosity, because if you don't have that, you will not learn. And those programs have been changed for, for, for time being, so, and they will change. So if you're not curious to learn new programs, then probably it, it will be difficult tomorrow for you. So um, this is the thing, but yeah, it's not about, it's of course to, to build up those programs, you need developers, but if you have the programs already, so being a fashion designer, you don't, you don't need to, to write a code at all. Idun, it's uh, your project, this interdisciplinary project in, in many different ways, and actually I don't mm. know how easy it is to put together this kind of totally different worlds. Uh, that's a skill of its own, and I guess that these guys also are aware that uh, it doesn't help if you have a very technical skilled developer. If it is useless in collaborating with people, it's hard. So these, uh, what they call it, 21st century skills, being creative, ability to solve problems and collaborate is one of the skills or central skills, but I was thinking, this is, this is not my thoughts, this is the educationalist Gert Piesta, a Dutch guy, who talks about uh, how, um, and now I'm talking more about not my field, but like the purpose of uh, education and art in education is that it has an overall meaning to, that we should educate people that are world-centered, that are not, uh, that are, developing their creative skills to solve today's problem, being climate change after our switch, he calls it referring to it or no, like the, how the society is more and more uh, in, what do you call it, Pol polarized. Mm -hmm. uh, so that also brings me in that my thought, that when you talk about the chat bots and how they challenge the education now, but maybe it's, um, Maybe this is what we need to kick the education system, which is still, um, some would say, the second industrial revolution level, that you just repeat knowledge, and it's not up to date to the fourth industrial revolution that we're in. So maybe we have to go <laughs> move. We need creative people, problem solvers, people that can collaborate, and people that are world-centered, not self-centered. Yeah. Absolutely, that's my, <laughs> again my small disclaimer about it being uh, working in, uh, in a university, it's, it's a daily problem we are facing, that how to create this kind of curriculas uh, which are quite old-fashioned, let's just say, this administrative stuff around us and uh, teach creativity among mm. young people, that's, uh, that's a challenge. It's, and the assessment uh, methods are really old. 
Y yes, <laughs> and it's, we, we are facing this kind of wicked, problem, wicked problems that actually we don't know the problem, what it is, and we don't have the answer. Our politicians know the answers, but they don't know the questions. And the <laughs> academia, academia, we know the questions, but we don't have answers. And now we are facing the new world, the digital opportunities, these wicked problems that we have, technology, but we don't know what is the problem and what will be the solution uh, for mm -hmm. that. That's, uh, that's really... Mm -hmm. uh, important to understand that the tools used so far in academic systems are not good enough for tomorrow. Uh, that's, uh, I comment on that. Uh, there's a subject in a different university than, my, than, my, than mine. But they have a subject on how to deal with fussy problems, referring to. So that's an engineering study. Mm. Yeah, I have, I have these, these combinations. Mm. Uh, I, I'm not sure about what are the expectations of our audiences? And uh, luckily, we don't have uh, too many questions coming in and uh, <laughs> interfering our, our dialogue. So, but uh, I have uh, a question to all of all of you. Uh, you, uh, as as a running of the businesses, uh, you have certain idea, vision about what you are you are doing, and you. I hope you are trying to make the world a better place. If you disagree, then uh, that's it. No, you don't? Uh, okay. And <laughs> <laughs> um, you have a different tools, different ways, different areas uh, in, in this way. What you will say for a critic saying that switching off electricity will be a solution for everything? Back to the coal mines. Yeah. I hey, but seriously, people are saying that about electric, electric cars, for example, that uh, production of energy, it's, you need uh, batteries, which are the mines of minerals, which are very, very special ones, and actually we don't save the planet when we are driving electric cars. You, you give the, this example about the fashion industry and, and all this kind of... What will be this positive... Uh, I don't know, recommendation or a point using digital technology in the creative world? Well, my, my work would be very difficult if electricity would be completely shut down, I can tell you that. <laughs> but um, I, I believe Senna is easier just to draw, and you have a violin, it's more easier. But yeah, <laughs> but uh, if, if we still get to have a little bit of electricity, <laughs> then, uh, then creating digital content, I think, is, is, is quite sustainable in a way that uh, it's, it's easy to replicate. And our goal uh, with with Model VR, with our, with our game, Booster Pilot, also is always why we make this game is that we want to give people emotions. So this is something where we have ended up sort of uh, because this is mm, where we think we can provide the most intense and, and, and pure emotions uh, to people. And our goal is not to replicate or, or replace, uh, it is to replicate, but not to replace the, the real world and sort of so that you can have very easily a uh, very intense and, and engaging experience, I mean, while you are in your pajamas in your, in your bedroom or living room, uh, which is not supposed to replace, you know, traveling to interesting places and doing interesting things, but sort of like uh, with... Um, with video calls that we, you know, since since the beginning of COVID, uh, we have kinda as as a, as a human race realized that you know we don't have to drive two hours and meet uh, every day. Uh, it doesn't mean that we don't want to meet other people at all, but sort of the baseline has shifted. So this is, I think, what uh, technology can do for us that. Uh, our everyday things that we do don't have to be that wasteful, but we can do these, these more resource intense things uh, more rarely in a way that you, to make our, our lives more effective in that regard. I agree. Entertainment is needed in, 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 a, in a certain amount, of course. It's, uh, yeah, and, and given that you already have the technology or you have made the investment to, to get these pieces of silicon and plastic, uh, then uh, then Mm, you know, uh, just creating different kind of digital content for those platforms is, is much more, uh, much less resource intensive than, I don't know, buying a new fridge every day. That, that would be 
to waste for. Mm -hmm. Senia, you will. Oh, okay. Yep. I would like to comment <laughs> uh, because um, uh, I uh, just uh, recently read a study about uh, sustainability and uh, VR and uh, there are lots of uh, papers about uh, how we can use VR to teach about sustainability. For example, on the water we can do remote uh, trainings and uh, lots of things uh, to be sustainable. And uh, already in the 90s, uh, tourism uh, industry was very afraid of uh, VR because they thought that nobody will uh, fly to other countries uh, if it gets too powerful. But uh, this hasn't happened. So traveling uh, will stay, but uh, we can uh, reduce our footprint if we use sometimes uh, VR traveling uh, also. And um, there was one uh, study about um, uh, life cycle of uh, VR glasses and it was very interesting because uh, they said that the biggest um, cost of damage on the environment uh, isn't actually producing the VR glasses but it's the distribution of VR glasses uh, and uh, it's uh, bigger in ICT than it's uh, with mobile phones or tablets. So this is one thing what we can uh, think about and uh, maybe find a solution. And uh, they also made a very uh, interesting uh, advice or uh, if uh, manufacturers are producing VR glasses then they should uh, reuse uh, gold and uh, it will uh, decrease the footprint of uh, production of VR glasses. Now, awareness, this is something we should keep in mind. Yeah. And we, we saw we have at least one sculpture here who had made a presentation how to use MacBook <laughs> uh, for a sculpture. It was really good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, still, I don't give mine. <laughs> uh, going to Xenia, it's, uh, this fashion industry, it, it's easy. I, of course, I cannot draw anything, but uh, you can use a still a pencil and uh, do the fashion in a physical way. Uh, you are still innovative, and you give a, a list of explanation why it's more efficient uh, to use, not to travel to China and, uh, I don't know, take a six months uh, and, and so on. Uh, it, it sounds very easy now. Is it, is it your life now? Is my life easy now? <laughs> So I do believe not only that my life is not easier with all the information that we have around us, it's like we all are super busy and overcrowded with information. So actually with all this technology, I believe that it's, it's tiring for us and we need a, like a kind of a creation of what kind of information to observe and what not. So it's not that it's easier, but it's um, again, not that we are looking for the easier solutions, isn't it? It's the same that if we switch off the electricity, I'm a bit like scared of, of, of easy solution, let's, let's switch it off. This is not how I believe like, things works in this world. It's more like, like you said, that you, know, you, you try to find from one part and another part some solutions and step by step you're integrating them in a nowadays life. It's not that you tell people that from tomorrow you don't use electricity anymore or that from tomorrow we'll all be naked here and use only digital fashion. This is not what, you know, what are the solutions. It's, uh, so what we try to do is that everybody of us try to do some, something, some steps towards to to make our planet a better place. And of course, all those uh, sending the samples forward and back and, and, and producing of things. And, but, but still, you can find there some better solution. In the, in the fashion, for example, easy example is with the web shopping, that if we could use uh, AI to predict and um, what people will buy and what fits you best, then you'll buy less and then there will be less things to ship to you and, and ship back to the web shop and even this already can help so much because today in the web shopping there is kind of 50 40 percent of, of goods that are shipped back and it's it's a huge amount of of, of uh, goods we are talking about and mostly they're never uh, they never find their place back in the stock because it's too expensive for brands to take those things back into their stock so they just destroy those things. 
So if we could find a good solution how people through web shopping could buy things that actually uh, suits them very well. So, you know, it's not about let's switch electricity out today or, or let's be naked. It's really about doing different steps towards better solutions. Yeah, uh, being more organized, more aware about uh, every click you are making and every package you are ordering from China. Yeah, and, and how you are making <laughs> it, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm. Idun, we are here we are meeting people actually who are working in uh, Mm, how to put it, commercialized world, but uh, your work is more like a public value. It's, uh, mm. uh, it's not, a, not about ticket sales or uh, selling tokens in your project. What is a public value of creation or using AI for using cultural heritage, for example? Well, it could be, I don't know if the term social innovation is correct, but um, you could uh, try your best to enable and emancipate, empower people by doing, using digital technologies. Um, again, this uh, French philosopher, Rancière, is talking about how you can um, use art and culture to um, shape up new worlds where new things can be said and where new people can get a voice. So, um, using art and culture is a way to disrupt power uh, hierarchies, for instance. But I, I don't know, that was a bit off, but I just wanted to comment on this step-by-step -step thing. That uh, I agree, I think it's more about changing perspectives. And uh, I have some uh, friends and colleagues back home that are into non-anthropocentric design. So they're doing video games, or not video games, uh, computer games <laughs> and uh, electronic art, but they try to do everything um, uh, more eco-centric. And that's a big kind of change of perspective. You can try yourself, try to come up with a new invention and test if it's harming the environment or uh, being uh, the traditional uh, anthropocentric way of thinking design or if it's eco-centric. An example of eco-centric would be to, if you're building a um, building, make sure you're doing as sustainable concrete as possible. Make it cover with greens to give something back to society. Make it less, make humans less invasive into the world. So that's a change in perspective. And they're also trying with their video, not video game, Computer video game, game. Video game is a <laughs> computer fine term. game designed to <laughs> monitor their footprint, both designing and when it's consumed. And I can't, I don't understand why this is not a standard thing. You manage to monitor food, what food are consists of, and washing machines and everything. Why, why can't we do it on digital artifacts? I can't do it myself, but maybe this blockchain technology, I don't know, this is not my field, but it should be possible to monitor how much you, for instance, when you make your computer game, uh, your footprint when you design it and when it's used and that you have different standards to choose from. Yeah. I don't know. I, I agree and uh, I believe that the key issue is uh, he here is awareness that we should understand what everything means actually and to be a sustainable in, in this, this field of arts or, or a culture actually it's raising awareness uh, it starts from there it's uh, remixing reusing these kind of re things actually uh, be uh, pillars for creating something new with uh, less environmental footprint and less consumption and um, there is still hope, Xenia. <laughs> there is, there is, <laughs> definitely. Now it's so we, uh, our time for this panel actually is unfortunately over. I knew there are two minutes more, but I didn't want to interrupt because uh, I was learning during these times. <laughs> and uh, if not mistaken, there must be somewhere a microphone and opportunity to ask the questions. Uh, I thought that the next presentation already is uh, willing, and we can see there is a question coming in. I 
I actually have a very simple question. And thank you personally, everybody of the talkers. Uh, it's been very interesting to see your projects and get to know what's going on, for, for example, in Estonia. The, the projects you're doing, I, I will happily keep track in the future. But the question is about this bootstrap uh, island thing. What's the age uh, limit you have in mind and when will be ready? Am uh, I allowed to play? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, we don't have an upper age limit. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure yet. It, it hasn't been rated yet. Um, officially, uh, every VR headset has written on their package that uh, not suitable for children are under 13. Um, which is because there hasn't been any long-term studies of the effects of virtual reality uh, on people because virtual reality hasn't existed for a long time. So this kind of research has been impossible to make so far. <laughs> but there's no uh, evidence uh, like it would be uh, somehow harmful to use, uh, to use VR uh, for people under 13 as well. Uh, so yeah, I don't have an answer. Um, I think uh, learning about survival is something that uh, all ages should be doing <laughs> a little bit to a, to a certain degree, but it just might be too scary for for some people. But yeah, uh, 2024 is when we think about releasing. And the question is, because the intensity of the game, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we are not creating a, a simulation. This is still a, a, a fictional piece, and um, since my background is in film, I want I want to create something which is uh, very very intense uh, because this intensity is, is part of the reason why we're doing it to give people emotions, to make them laugh and scream and and be frustrated when they fail and happy when they don't fail. Uh, so. Yeah, um, there is definitely less intense ways <laughs> to learn about survival. I think this um, physical part is just so cool that mm -hmm. you have uh, some kind of levels or uh, levels of experience, for example, that children could experience uh, mm -hmm. being involved in a game and, uh, and at the same time not being static. That would be very cool. So yeah, you have this I, I mean, that's, that's super interesting. I mean, I could talk about it for hours probably, but, but the idea is that um, when you do something physically, it's not only that you give, your brain gives commands to your hand to do something, but also you get feedback from your body. Uh, if you are doing some specific motions, then uh, this emotion becomes so much more for you uh, because, because your, your body is also convinced that you're doing this thing, even if it's not you know, 100% accurate because you can have like feedback from everything you touch and that's, we're not there yet technology-wise, but it's still, uh, it can create uh, so much better uh, experience and, and so much more vivid uh, memories from that, yeah. I actually have one more question. It's um, how much time do you expect the experiencer or the game player to spend in that game? Or like, what's, is there a safe exit or is it like the, the you know, we read about the evil plans that every every platform figures an algorithm. What would what would invite the person to spend more and more time in your application? Mm -hmm. So, what's your do you have a healthy limits, or you also want you know the more the better? Uh, that's that's one of the reasons why uh, I I always kind of cringe when people compare virtual reality to to the mobile platforms because mobile platforms are kind of designed to rob your eyeballs uh, for indefinite time, basically. Uh, with virtual reality, it would become just physically too exhausting <laughs> uh, to, to play while standing up and with your hands. You can't, you can't do it for hours. I mean, I, I would be very impressed if somebody did it for hours. Uh, so you you would probably get tired and this is why we design the game uh, from the ground up 
for virtual reality in a way that that even the the length of the experience uh, would be somehow compressed. For example, the day-night cycle is about 10 minutes, and uh, and we don't expect most players to survive the first night. So, <laughs> so uh, it's kind of like uh, uh, the friction, the, the the barrier of entry to to going into the game would be very very uh, light, and it's kind of like I feel like surviving on a tropical island and you put on a headset and you're immediately in there and you can do it for 10 minutes and you can do it for an hour and then you can take it off and continue where you left off the next time. So that's, that's super important with virtual reality, I think. Thank you. It's super important to keep our time schedule and we are only 8 minutes 35 seconds over the time. So uh, precisely. Thank you so much. Our panelists, give a hand. Uh, yes, please. There are small souvenirs from the organizers. Thank you. And uh, regarding regarding times and control over uh, over lives, uh, Rico, you can please uh, come here. It's, it's a connection line with our next presentation. Uh, music is avatar. Yes. Uh, yeah, but just about digital world, music and control. I received a message from my iPhone telling me that I'm listening too much uh, of music on a weekly That's basis. Impossible. It is, and it tune, uh, tunes the volume down a little bit, saying that it's too much music for your, yourself for during this week. It happened to me. I have recently. never heard of it. I have a watch that says it's too loud but never it's, you know, too long or something. Yeah, I had a time limit for the music and I was really confused and it's, it's an Estonian word which I will not use for this one and I, I hope that you have some kind of explanation how I could listen still the music as long as I would like to. Uh, I would say you, you should riot. Like, don't, don't listen to the uh, iPhone. <laughs> uh, and, and just keep on going. Music is only good for you. I believe so. Yes. And so, please, stage, uh, stage is yours. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Reigo Ahven, and I'm uh, actually as analog as somebody could be. I'm a drummer. So, I have hated digital drums from the day one, uh, but I must say, they do work at some situations, so uh, don't take it uh, so black and white. I am the founder of a jazz club called Philly Joe's that will turn 10 years old this um, uh, Christmas. And I'm also the CEO of Fermas, a fair trade music streaming platform that will transform the way we listen to local music, hopefully. And I promise this app will never say you are listening for too long. So, my um, hypothesis is that music is avatar. For tens of thousands of years, the only way to listen to music also in Estonia was to make music. And I loved it. Everybody played a bagpipe or violin or whatever. They were never in tune. Not uh, uh, maybe like every unique instrument. They might have been in tune, but to play two bagpipes together, it's a challenge also today. But 1888, there was the first recording um, a song called The Lost Chord, which actually made it possible to listen to music without the musician actually making it in real time. So, I must say music was kind of, let's say, uh, besides the, uh, the art, um, was the first one that was on the path of being digitalized and it went well but 
now, thinking about uh, digitalizing the experience, I'm here to uh, give you some examples from my personal uh, experience. And we, as a chess club, I must say it's, a, it's an old tradition. Uh, it's always done in small cellars. We are playing only vinyls for uh, nine years in a row, so obviously not so digitalized. But there, is, there are some things that make us actually uh, take the leap of faith or actually the leap of survival to digitalize. 12th um, of March 2020, uh, the COVID hit really bad Estonia, uh, uh, to Estonia and all the concert and concert places were cancelled uh, right there and then. And it took only one day for us to set everything up at Philly Joe's to become a digitalized or let's say the band became an avatar so you could actually watch it from wherever you want it. The thing about chess clubs is also it's really small. We can fit a bit more than 100, but then we'll probably get a fine or something. So 100 is our limit. But during this concert, 3,500 people watched it the same evening. And that actually sparked something. We developed something like Philly Joe's TV. There is more than 70 concerts there. It is the, uh, I think, the, the most efficient uh, concert archive, I don't know, solution of the last uh, few years. And we got the national award of being the virtual um, experience provider of the country. So anyways, we had to do it. We didn't have any other choices. So now about music, being a musician and uh, a CEO of Fermas that is trying to find a solution that is sustainable and uh, is fair to all the musicians and music right holders in the world. As you can see, the physical sales of music are decreasing annually in a great pace. Um, for 2030, the streaming market uh, size is about 90 billion. People have never, ever listened to more music than today. At the same, same time, musicians are getting paid less and less. It's really close to nothing. Can you imagine only one out of 1,000 is making more money than they spend on putting the music on the platform? So it's really, really not fair. So we were figuring out what could be done. So let's say if we provide every musician in the world with a solution like this. As I said, there has to be a better way, but nobody is actually interested uh, rocking the boat because the status quo really works for the big labels and the streaming companies. So we had some hypotheses. So if the musicians can add their music for free, we can say that adding music is enough, big enough of an investment. The money distributed should be 100% user-centric, which means if you subscribe to a streaming app and you listen to somebody, then they should get the money. When you listen to Spotify, I'm sorry to say, Drake gets it all. It's okay. So there should be no middlemen. And how is that possible? It is possible thanks to the digitalization and the technological steps we have taken, not only as Fermos, but as the world. 
and it is possible to determine a digital fingerprint of every song. Now we can say who should and who shouldn't get the money for that. So data in real time to the artists. Can you imagine that if you listen to somebody and you do it over and over again, then the artist will get the information that you might dig it. And they can send you invitations to the concerts, invitations to listen to the single, and maybe if you really dig them, they can invite you over and bake you pancakes. It's all good. So this is only the tip of the iceberg that digitalization can offer us. Actually, we are in the process of creating tools for the whole life cycle of a culture act, which means even when somebody has an idea, I would like to record uh, a tune where we both dance with three accordions connected to us with Petri Alakas, and we, we then let our fans know. This is a brand new band, we don't have too many fans yet. But nevertheless, we can actually include fans right away because of those digital pathways that do not exist during um, like the pre-time of, of Fermas. So the, it's a, there's a myriad of possibilities that open up and meaningful, meaningful two-way relationships between the artists and their fans, because this is what matters. As uh, we heard, the games are created because of creating emotions. And actually, at the end, what do we have besides emotions? So, um, in Estonia, it is possible to get together with a team and maybe ask the president of um, the country to support uh, it with uh, his knowledge, uh, love Estonia, and as uh, I have to say in 17 minutes, uh, 17 seconds, um, I must say I'm convinced that uh, music is avatars, digitalization is the key, and I must say it's really important that uh, that we understand that um, the progress sometimes needs a bit of a push. Can you imagine? I'm 41 years old. I have always been hiring um, really beautiful designers and, and the developers. And this is the first presentation I have done from zero to 100. It wasn't that bad, eh? Yes. We all can digitalize! <laughs> Yes, let's keep kicking the digital doors open. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. It was really, really in inspiring. And it's, I really look forward for the moment when Rego comes and makes pancakes to my family. And it's, can you join us in a Sunday morning at 10? Yes, of course. <laughs> thank you so much. And in physical way, not in a virtual, yes? <laughs> yeah, let's listen to music, not Estonian only, but uh, all the artists and musicians are the salt and pepper of our lives, that's, that's for sure. Thank you, Rego, and now we have a time for our final panel. Uh, please uh, come, come to the stage, uh, Eva, you will make introduction of the panel members, I hope so, or if not, then Sonia Barani. Uh, Italian Chamber for Commerce for Germany. Yes, please take a have a please. And then we have Julia Villafranca Molero. So yes, please. And Eva Limit, Creative Estonia. It will be a physical panel and I will leave you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So we are to stack, Eva, or should I? Yeah, I, I leave the floor you, Sonia. Is our, we are now introducing our project, and Sonia is the project manager. Please, Sonia. 
Yeah, first of all, I have to say we are very honored that we can wrap up our project in such an inspiring environment. We are also a bit, I mean, impressed because your projects are great and we, I mean, both of us, we are not that expert in um, digital technologies, but we know what companies need because, for example, in my case, I work for the Italian Chamber of Commerce in Germany, so we are very much... Um, in contact with the companies of our network and uh, we have several companies in the tourism and cultural fields and um, in the first panel we were talking about skills and skills that they need uh, for the digital transformation of their company and this is um, where our project uh, is active. So um, I would like to start with a very quick introduction on the Erasmus Plus program because I am pretty sure that everybody here associates the Erasmus program with the mobility of university students. So this is how the Erasmus program was born um, 30, more than 30 years ago. But actually it is not the only thing that the Commission enables through the program. So not only mobility for university students, mobility for other kind of uh, stakeholders like teachers, like also entrepreneurs, for example, but not only mobility, because the Commission fosters um, education and continuous education through the Erasmus program. So whenever you hear that uh, a course or an education possibility is financed through the Erasmus program, that means that it is for free. So you have a lot, a lot of courses uh, where you can just update your skills and they are all for free and um, financed by the Commission. And this is also where our project, Creative Digital Transformation, um, was financed two years ago, so now we are at the end. And um, the origin of our project are in 2020, so when we were all locked in our homes. Um, at that time, so the Commission, they were very much aware that uh, cultural and tourism companies um, who already have some digitalized services, of course, um, they had a lot of advantages because they didn't lose the contact to their public. So it was very important for all um, tourism and cultural companies to update their digital skills because, of course, now COVID is over, we can say more or less, but anyhow, people are used to um, have digitalized um, services also in culture and tourism, and they are expecting to find them also now that the pandemic is over. So our idea was to help these companies um, to acquire the skills that they need for the digital transformation. Because, um, I mean, I, I work with a lot of tourism companies especially, and when you talk about digitalization, they are all ears because they're very much interested, but they have no idea what skills do I need. In the first panel, uh, someone said you don't need to be coding, for example, if you want to create an uh, NFT. Um, so this is the same for tourism companies. They have no idea what skills they need, which stakeholders they need, uh, how much money they need. So they heard about a lot of technologies, virtual realities, advanced, um, I mean, uh, artificial intelligence, but they have no idea what kind of digital technology fits to their content. So they need um, to be accompanied um, in this journey, and this is what we wanted to do. So um, our project, Creative Digital Transformation, fosters the, um, yeah, the development that the um, uptaking of digital skills by tourism and cultural staff, but also managers, so both employers and employees, so that they can, um, they can contribute to the digital transformation of uh, their sector. So as I was saying, the project started two years ago, so now we are ending the project at the end of this month. And uh, we were a group of um, associations from um, different countries in Europe. So my organization, we were coordinating the project and we are based in Germany, but then we have uh, colleagues from Spain, from Estonia, from Romania and uh, from Italy. And we work together in this journey um, to help tourism and cultural professionals. <coughs> Sorry, I don't feel very well today. <laughs> Okay, now I'm fine, sorry. Thank you. <coughs> so
So, sorry for the interruption. So this is what we have been doing in the last um, two years. So first, we wanted to provide our companies and staff with ideas, with inspirations, because sometimes it is difficult to find good ideas. So it might be very useful to know what other organizations in Europe did before. So the first thing that we did, it was to collect best practices at European level. So we collected good examples of digital transformation in several sectors, so in culture, in tourism and in education. <coughs> <coughs> and we put it in a visual virtual map on our, on our uh, project website. Then the second thing was to um, empower these companies and these professionals with skills. So we um, created an online course, actually two online courses, so one for managers and self-employed and the second one for staff and educational, um, <coughs> and educational staff. Uh, to help them uh, develop um, their digital skills. Also to let them know which are the technologies available and which skills do you need to, um, to enhance the digital transformation of your company. So just for you to know, all these results are available and for free on our website and they will be available and for free also in the future, even if our project um, is about to end. And then the third um, result, so the third thing we have been uh, working at are webinars on creative process planning because of course you know, I mean our participants after step two, they had ideas about what is possible because they maybe they had a look at our map and then they attended our courses uh, who were online so now they know also which are the possible technologies that they can use but how to do so really how to put it in place and to come up with a good idea for their company so this was the um, actually the content of this webinar series I can take over if you want yeah okay yes. perfect sure. <laughs> okay um, so uh, now I'm going to go a little bit into the results into the products that we've been creating but first I would like to contextualize um, all these educational uh, part of Erasmus plus uh, we all know what the uh, university degrees is or uh, vocational courses but adult education and non-formal education is something that very few people know about uh, actually and um, you have to think of these professionals and staff and managers from uh, touristic companies or creative industries or cultural small organizations um, who actually need the skills but don't have the time to go into university and take a degree. So uh, imagine a small um, cultural organization with no skills at all about digitalization. Like, wh what can they do? They won't go into university. They won't stop working for that. So Erasmus Plus gives this opportunity for them to do small trainings, to get uh, training on their own from home through online courses for free. So that's what, what we've been doing here, collecting practices for them to on their own learn about them, creating these courses for them to learn uh, at their own pace and on their own. And um, something else that we think is very positive, here you're all very uh, well educated in English and other languages but some countries like ours for example Italy I don't know Romania Spain um, most people don't speak English fluently so all the materials we've been doing are in all languages so they're in Estonia and they're in, 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 uh, in Spanish and English and Italian so uh, I don't know a shop owner of handcrafts uh, can take this course in their own language and then learn how to digitalize their pro products or how to start uh, uh, an online platform to sell them, for example. Like very basic stuff, but useful, I would say. So here you can see how this uh, virtual map looks like. And it's basically a map where you would like scroll around and you would see uh, good examples from different countries. There are many from Estonia and some of them we have visited them here during these days. And uh, yeah, these are just some examples um, where let's say you are a uh, tourist operator and you would like to digitalize some of your products so would you would be able to see what other companies similar to yours are doing here um, as she was saying we have two courses one are uh, one is for managers and directors of the companies and the other one is for staff so one for example this one that uh, is for the managers would go more into 
um, how to identify your audience uh, needs, uh, what's the market demands, and would go more into management uh, things of your company. And uh, we will be showing people the tools that they can use, the software, the platforms, uh, which ones they can get for free, which ones are like payable. And uh, it's kind of uh, easy to like navigate, and um, it's a it's not a, the typical boring textbook where you would be reading. And uh, I, we think it's very useful for for people with basic skills in the area. And uh, yeah, so these are just some slides. You see, like very basic do's and don'ts in different topics. Uh, we. We deal with the, the skill set uh, of the Erasmus, like of the commission, and try to give them like the whole overview of the skills that they need and where to get them. Yeah, and then, yeah, so we, we give them some templates that they can download, for example, to create the Canva model process in their own companies. Um, there's these uh, online panels where they can go and share ideas with other uh, entrepreneurs or other people in the same industry as theirs. And yeah, well, here's the QR code if you want to scan it. Uh, if not, it's just creativedigitaltransformation.eu and uh, you will be able to get all the information there. And about the webinars, I think Eva is going to yeah, speak a okay. bit about them. Yeah, the webinars part was uh, our task uh, on this project. And uh, as this uh, first two results was about uh, sharing information and giving advice how to establish a digitalization program, uh, then our part in webinars, the topic is about uh, uh, training skills, more soft skills, and uh, the seven webinars uh, all partners were was uh, establishing uh, at least uh, one webinar and uh, as previously was said that uh, they are all available also in uh, our local languages so that all materials are on the website uh, usable usable for you in estonian that you don't miss any details you can understand everything correctly and uh, there is uh, many good um, uh, content, but we have short trailer to, to show uh, how the webinar is promoted. Could we put this in? So uh, it means it's about, uh, how, uh, it was previously today also speaking uh, some panelists that uh, how to find idea, here is some tips, how to create uh, idea, how to develop idea further, uh, how to design a digital service, also very important part on this uh, digitalization, and how to start project uh, so that the uh, these are very useful topics and uh, and I hope that uh, it will be also today's event will be inspire you that you will take the link to this our website to to watch these uh, best practices around Europe many are from Estonia you will recognize some familiar places I hope so and uh, and the webinars, and we are very happy if you will use them, that we have worked, and in our 
Creative Estonia team, I can say that we learned ourselves a lot about digitalization, many new digital tools, and uh, now we feel better to, to face this important uh, period, what is around us, and uh, we can't live anymore without digitalization, so that we are pre better prepared, and I wish you same. You want to end, uh, Sonia? Is there anything? Yeah, um, here maybe you can find the topics um, of the okay. webinars. They yeah. are all like 15 minutes, so you can just maybe have a look mm -hmm. at them. And um, yeah, um, if you would like to use uh, or at least to have a look at the materials that we produce, we would be very happy because <coughs> our project is about to end, but it's always nice when we know that someone is using the content. So in case you want it, um, you can scan the QR code or visit our website. Yeah. Mm. So that you have heard uh, a lot uh, this academical part about digitalization, some good cases, uh, what is presented today. Now, if you take this our platform as a starting point, we wish you success. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentations and Please use opportunity to look on the practical materials available free of charge for everything. Thank you the audience here physically present. It's always enjoyable to see real faces and thank you also to the audience online, YouTube today or maybe in, in some days in the future. That's all folks, I said at the end of animations. You know this rabbit coming out. So. Thank you, and thank you, technicians, and thank you, Law of Esti or Creative Estonia, for having me here. It was a good learning opportunity for me. Definitely, I'm much, much more smarter than I was four hours ago. Thank you, and see you. Say